Oh, healthy people. Okay. All right, everybody. Let's do a call to order here. Uh, good afternoon. This is a special meeting of the Public Assets and Native Communities Committee. The date is February 6th and the time is 10.04. I'm joined by Councilmember Herbolt, Councilmember Peterson, and Councilmember... Well, I was, I was going to say, I was going to combine... I was going to combine Mosqueda and Gonzalez and say Moscales. That's exciting. <laughs> Mosqueda. Like that <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview of the chair's report. We have a pretty ambitious schedule, but my understanding is we're going to limit our presentations to 15 minutes per presentation. So I want to welcome a new chapter and to our newest committee members that are here, Councilmember Peterson and Councilmember Mosqueda, thank you for being here. This is the most exciting committee, just so you know. Um, this committee meets on the first Tuesday at 2 p.m. Otherwise, we hold additional meetings titled special meetings like this one. This committee is structured to provide policy direction and oversight and to deliberate and make recommendations on legislative matters relating to parks, community centers, public grounds, including Seattle Parks and Recreation, the Woodland Park Zoo at Seattle Aquarium, the Seattle Center, the Seattle Public Library System, Office of the Waterfront, and many other um, infrastructure and major government projects that we work on. Um, and we also work on Native American issues, including housing affordability, health, mental health services, services for youth, access to justice, art, culture, and historic preservation. Our committee clerk is Nagin Kamkar. She will aid in clerking our meetings as well as policy management. She has provided introductory material to each of you to start off the year. Let's see here. The packet includes, you have two things here. So the first one is the committee schedule and legislation deadlines. That's the light colored document. And then the second one is, I've labeled two and two B, is the Seattle Parks governance and funding chart. And I would ask you to pay particular attention, especially you new folks, to this funding chart. Thank you, Tracy Ratcliffe, because it's taken me years to figure this out, and now we have a nice handy-dandy chart that explains the $262 million um, Seattle Parks and Recreation budget. As you can see, it's a combination of money from the Seattle Parks District funds, $54 million, the City of Seattle funds, $206 million, and State and King County funds, which acts, comes out to about $2.3 um, and as you all know, as members of Seattle City Council, you also sit on the Seattle Park and District Funds, also known as the Metropolitan Park District Board, in which we're getting ready on our six-year plan, and we will be looking at that schedule and pulling everything together uh, probably in October of 2020. So today, we'll hear from our departments and stakeholders on upcoming projects. We have five items on the agenda. The first four items are department overviews and a look ahead to their 2020 work plans. Again, this is an ambitious schedule for today. Um, starting with, um, first we'll have Seattle Parks and Recreation. We'll have Office of the Waterfront and Civic Projects, Seattle Public Library, the Seattle Center, and the fifth item is going to be introductions on overview from the Seattle Indian Health Board, a local community health center. They are nationally recognized researchers behind the missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls epidemic. For our, new, for our new council members, you will learn a lot about this topic. Last September, the city passed a resolution dedicated to address this subject. This was followed by city budget investment for contract work, as well as one FTE addition to the Seattle Police Department data division for the missing, murdered Indigenous women girls casework. So I look forward to hearing more of that from everybody involved. Um, I should add, before we actually sum up, Seattle Indian Health Board, um, my understanding is Esther Lucero is running a little bit late. Um, I wanted to wait till Esther got here to make the, I'll make the announcement a couple times, but um, we're very proud. The um, National Congress of American Indians has been around for over 65 years, and every year we meet in uh, Washington, D.C., and we also go back to Washington, D.C. to meet with our lobbyists for the city of Seattle, which is great, and we also meet with um, not only our congressional delegation, but our senators and everyone. So this year, I'm really happy to announce that Senator Kamala Harris will be introducing Abigail Echohawk and receiving a prestigious award from the Honoring Women's Nation. Um, which is one of the highest awards you can get as a Native American woman for um, 
providing opportunity and access to justice for Native American women. So we're excited about that. Every year, um, Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell sit with us and do the introductions. Last year, we had Senator Warren, Senator Sharice Davids, and Senator Deb Holland with us, and Congresswoman Shire. So we'll have all these individuals again. So this is a wonderful award, and I'm really proud of Abigail Elkahawk. So with that, public comment. There's no people. <laughs> so we have no public comment today. So with that, public comment is closed. We'll move to items of business. So we'll first people up, we have our um, sale parks and rec. Uh, that's you, Jesus. Is it just you? That's me. Okay. Hi. You and a PowerPoint. Yeah. I apologize. I had to come on show. I mess it up. But. Oh. <laughs> Item oh, one, not. Seattle parks and... Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, I've got... I went into Nagin's territory. <laughs> Go ahead, Nagin. Seattle parks... <laughs> Item one, Seattle Parks and Recreation Department Overview and 2020 Work Plan. Okay, I'll just, okay, sorry. We have one job to do and I want to do it. <laughs> hey, Jesus, it's good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, thank you. We're really excited because we got our six year planning thing coming up. We do, it's gonna be a very busy year. Lots of great engagement with our communities and our stakeholders, so we're really looking forward to the year. So I will let you go through your presentation and what I do with my committee meetings, particularly with this one today, is if my colleagues have a question, just feel free to put them to the superintendent. No need to look to me and raise your hand. I think you guys know how this works. Jesus is pretty good about page numbers and PowerPoints and keeping us informed, so I'll let you take it away, Jesus. Sure, thank you, and I, I will just share that we passed out some, um, some good uh, sort of Paraphernalia for you, the, the, the fold-out is sort of a good Parks and Rec 101, shows you some of the who we are and what we do. Uh, and then the other one is one of our reports on the Park District uh, planning that we, you know, we do on a regular basis. So you can you know, take those, and we're happy to provide more if you need more of those. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to present to you a quick overview of the department, and, and especially for the, for the new folks on the committee. As the council member said, this is the best committee um, <laughs> there is. Um, and and it, so we're excited to have this opportunity to share with you in the public a uh, quick overview of Parks and Recreation and then happy to answer any questions about our work now and, and moving forward. Uh, and uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation, I, I tell folks, we, we are really fortunate. We have one of the best Parks and Recreation systems in the country. Uh, it's one of the largest departments in the city. Um, uh, I'll go over some of the specific details there. Uh, it also has a rich history. So Denny Park, uh, the place where my office is, is actually the city's first park, was founded in 1884. Uh, we are now sort of being surrounded by very tall buildings, so uh, I'm glad we still have have that anchor there. Uh, and then the, the system was really founded about 20 years later when uh, the Board of Park Commissioners invited the famed Olmsted um, landscape architecture firm to come out and help design a parks and rec system, a uh, system of boulevard Bards, parks, green belts across the community, and that still serves as the anchor for our parks and recreation system. Um, our mission is pretty straightforward and, and, and still anchored in kind of that Olmsted, um, uh, the Olmsted origins, and it's really about providing safe and welcoming places for people to play, learn, and contemplate, um, but also recognizes our significant responsibility in the stewardship of this land and of this, the, the great resources that we have. Um, our vision really is, and I'll go into each of these in a little more detail as we move forward, but it's about helping people be healthy, ensuring the environment is healthy, and then building strong communities. Uh, and we do this through our values of, of uh, promoting equity, uh, opportunity, access, and of course, again, sustainability. So as we dig into these um, values a, a little bit more, uh, it really has anchored the work that we're doing. Um, and, and we really look at, for example, on the healthy people side, um, look for, uh, to, to participate and support a healthy wide vision for, for a population, excuse me, a citywide vision for a healthy population. So we envision folks that are healthy moving around, uh, that feel safe and welcome in our public spaces, uh, but also that have set, you know affordable and uh, fresh food, that practice health, healthy habits that prevent disease and enhance physical and mental well-being. And of course, we can't do all of those things alone, but we really support all of the efforts of the rest of the city. Um, in terms of the environment, as I said at the beginning, we have a significant responsibility uh, as stewards of a significant part of the land. We, we control 12% of the land of the city. Um, and so, you know, we're really focused on mitigating the impacts of climate change, um, uh, making sure that our urban forest stays healthy and grows, um, and then really provo providing environmental responsibility uh, with our educational programs. Uh, and then even with our own operations, making sure that our infrastructure is, is uh, supporting these efforts. 
And then the third anchor here in our in our vision is is the strong communities piece. And and this is again one where we we really seek to support all of the needs of community members, whether it's supporting um, the the educational outcomes of children through our before and after care programs, through our child care and daycare and things like that, uh, but also also supporting economic development and and ensuring to that, that we provide opportunities for for youth employment, etc. And then all of the convenings that we do in our public spaces through our event planning, our off leash areas, uh, in our community centers that really build strong, resilient communities uh, and make sure that folks feel like they're part of a, an interconnected city and, and, and a vibrant city. Um, also key to our work uh, is this idea of equity and, and you know, in the last couple of years we've been engaged with the public and in, internally as well uh, to, to craft a new strategic plans that's going to guide our work over the next uh, 12 years. Uh, and, and a key component of this is, is um, a new initiative we're, we're calling our Pathway to Equity. And this is really uh, focused on uh, playing our role in, in supporting the elimination of institutional and structural racism and, and really making sure that uh, we, we achieve racial equity in our city as part of our work. Um, and so our, the, the pieces for us really focus on uh, our work in terms of our policies and our procedures and making sure that there's, a, there's an equity filter for that, really continuing to work with our workforce and, and training them um, last couple of years, we've, we've done a lot of additional training uh, in our foundations of change and, again, trying to move towards becoming an anti-racist organization. Uh, and then prioritizing equity in the way we do our investments. Um, and, and, you know, one of the steps that will come out of this is creating an equity scorecard where we'll look at, you know, we'll map out and look at all the indicators that, that impact these issues and, and um, begin to make investments in programs and facilities based on that scorecard. Uh, and, and I guess the final piece I'll say here that's really critical is, is reimagining, rethinking our engagement strategy and our accountability to the community to make sure that we're out uh, engaging with folks and, and especially with folks that, that uh, we haven't traditionally reached and, and looking for new ways to do that. So uh, this will anchor all of our work uh, both in 2020 and beyond. And then another aspect of, of this, in addition to our, our key values of healthy, healthy, strong, and then the equity piece, is, is this organizational excellence piece. We want to make sure that we have a uh, world-class workforce that's well-trained, that is clear about uh, where, where we're headed, uh, that has the tools to do the work, but is also just focused on collaboration and excellence and professionalism. Uh, we're looking to, to identify best practices in the work that we do, uh, really focusing our systems and our processes to make sure we're doing the best job that we can to honor our responsibility to taxpayers, uh, and, and, and beginning and continuing to include new technologies and, and innovation and, and best practices and, uh, in the work that we do. And, and part of that is just making sure that we're not stuck on just doing things the way we've been doing them because that's the way we've been doing them. So really pushing ourselves to, to become uh, an organ, continue to work on becoming an organizational, uh, an excellence organization. So how do we do that? Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the robustness of our park system. We have uh, 6,400 acres of parkland uh, across the city uh, in uh, 485 individual parks. Uh, and as, as I said, this represents 12% of the city land, but you can see the long list here and there's more, uh, but this includes boulevards, 120 miles of trails, our community centers, our pools, uh, our beaches, golf courses, we have 207 sports fields, 151 play areas, 14 off-leash areas, and much, much more. And as we have found out and, and hear every day, uh, if we were to, to leave it up to our communities, it would be many more of these, uh, each, of, uh, each of these things. So folks really appreciate what we do and, and want more of it. Jesus, can you hold yep. up a minute? Thank you. Yep. Um, just uh, a quick question. Thinking back to um, your uh, reference earlier to an equity scorecard, um, have we sort of used that concept to plot out um, these facilities? So, so that's the work that we're doing. So, so certainly we we know where everything is, and and, and <laughs> that is known. Yes, but have um, we have we translated that information? Th that's what we're in the middle of doing right now. So, so for example, OPCD and Office of Civil Rights have done a lot of work and a lot of data on. For example, the indicators that lead to displacement for communities. So, so we're we're layering all of that on top of this, so that when we do go back and 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 you know when there's a choice about an investment of a resource, uh, I want to be able to have the data that 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 says, well, this community has has greater needs for because of these indicators, and we will go there. And and I mean, I think 
it, it's it's a it's a it's an important and and can be difficult conversation, frankly, to have with our communities because I think the concept of equity is really you know people are are open to that, um, but at the same time, folks want things in their community. So so we're gonna we're gonna sort of have to be very committing uh, to equity means letting go it, of the concept of. Thing, everything being equal. E equality, exactly. <laughs> um, yes, and so we, we, we're going to have to be very steadfast and stubborn about that conversation, and we really will need and appreciate the support from the council and the other elected officials to make sure we can do that. Councilor yeah. Pearson? And piggybacking off of what Councilmember Herbold mentioned, in my District 4, we've got Magnuson Park, and things are dynamic, mm -hmm. right? We've just opened up. Uh, there are hundreds of more low-income children who live there now, and they don't necessarily have access or scholarships to enable them to participate on the fields or in the programs there. And, you know, the Magnus Park Community Center needs to be rehabbed. So more, they, the, there are nearly 1,000 low-income residents there right at Magnuson Park that we've encouraged to live there. We've enabled them to live there, and now we want to provide those services. So i um, happy to hear you talking about the equity scorecard concept. Yeah, thank you. And 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 Magnuson absolutely is 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 a it's a great sort of microcosm of so many things happening in the parks and recreation system, uh, both with the work that we do as well as all of the residents there. And um, for example, the, the community center actually is in the process of being rehabbed and expanded to add some additional programming space. Um, and and we really are focused on making sure that there's enough uh, either free programming or scholarship opportunities for the folks in in that park. So we'll we'll continue to work on that. There's more work to be done, but absolutely. Yeah. And to clarify on the Magnuson Park rehab, it's really just just about 20% of the building that's being rehabbed right now, just sort of the entryway and some seismic stuff. But we look forward to doing even more yeah. in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Sus, I got quick. Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you for this chart. I don't know if you had given this to us before. I, you know, I'm, I'm big on lists. Um, so thank you. I'm going to ask at some point that we expand that um, on the, I, we still have this issue. I think Councilman Herbert can appreciate this on the 123 restroom, restroom buildings, that we need more restrooms in this city. Um, that's something that I'm, we're still gonna probably take another run at in budget uh, citywide for more restrooms, not just in parks. I'm guessing it would be parks or SPU that would maintain them. Um, that is something that we'll talk about, just putting that here out there now. And also with the stadium, are you talking about Memorial Stadium when you say we have one stadium? Uh, no, this is uh, West Seattle Stadium. Oh, okay. It's in our I, yeah. I did not know. What's it called? West Seattle, West Seattle Stadium. Stadium. Okay, wow. Yeah. I've been chair of parks for four years, did not know that. Thank you for being here, Councilor Herbold. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Councilmember uh, Mosqueda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good to see you again. Good Thank you, you again for this information. I do have a few questions just about uh, a few priorities that we've worked on over the last mm -hmm. two years. Let me know if you have this integrated into your presentation or if you'd rather um, address it now. Uh, when it comes to the number of the kiddie pools that we had expanded, I believe we had invested in additional hours for the kiddie right. pools to be open. Can yeah. you comment on that? And then um, uh, additionally, uh, was there... It may have been the year before last. Um, I believe that we included a proviso or language in the budget to request that the fields be open for longer periods of time in the evening so that there was um, lit fields so that there could be unstructured play, especially as we think about our immigrant and refugee population um, or families within our city that don't have the resources yep. to pay for structured play like the soccer mm -hmm. teams that I used to be on two years ago. Um, <laughs> At, you know, when we see more people out enjoying our great new turf fields in the light, that means that people are engaged in um, really positive physical activity, and I think it also adds an element of uh, healthy communities for the lights to be on and things like that. So can you talk about whether or not we were able to implement that? I was just struggling to remember the other day. Sure. Uh, uh, on the on the waiting pool issue in the spray parks, we did uh, implement an extension of hours and, and days in, in, of operation for certain sites. I don't have that list in front of me, but we can we can uh, get that to you. Um, I, I think it, that is part of our longer plan as well, is just to sort of try to figure out what's the best um, and, and most equitable distribution of those hours and, and, and those pools. And then and, and actually, we're also thinking about how we can align that with some of our sustainability work. So for example, 
ideally, I would take, we would take those wading pools and actually convert them to spray parks. Kids love the spray parks. They're better for the environment. We don't have to staff them as much. They're healthier, safer, and all those things. So that's part of our work there. Uh, but again, it'll be anchored in sort of where, where the use is and where the need is. But, but we, we did make some changes, and we'll continue to look at that. Obviously, you don't have any of those spray parks and kiddie pools open right now in this weather. Right. So um, is your timing to be done with that analysis prior to this spring and summer when they open? Um, so we have a schedule for opening already that, that, is, that is based on our normal operations as well as the enhancement. So that's, that's continuing. In terms of converting them to, to additional spray parks, okay. that's a longer term so plan. So you are already yeah. going to move forward with implementing the longer hours, um, but the conversation around conversion is for the future. Yeah, Got it. that's correct. Okay. Yep. And in terms of the field, I think you hit on, on a, a, an incredibly important aspect of the management of these fields. I'm not, from, I'm not aware of a proviso on that. We'll find out. But, but it is part of what we've already been working on in in fact, we did a pilot, and, and maybe it was driven by, in some ways, by the proviso, but we did a pilot to, to do just that, to carve out some, some commun unstructured, unpermitted community time at certain fields, uh, because uh, you know often we find when we invest in these fields, uh, the local community members have to deal with the impacts of the additional use, but not necessarily get the benefit of that. Uh, one thing we are doing, and, and this is also um, in, in um, Councilmember Herbold's district, but part of, part of the redevelopment of South Park uh, play field, um, we have agreed to keep that field off out of our permitting system for five years so that we can allow that community to build their own programming and sort of we can, oh, we can provide that. those things. So uh, we're working on that and, and, and I think it's a really critical piece. I, I think every field should have unstructured, unpermitted community time, um, you know, and we're trying to, trying to sort of find the right balance because all of the, the folks who use the fields continue to grow with their programming. So we, we, we need to, and we have a very finite um, number of hours of field space and we're not going to be able to buy too many new fields. Part of that also is with the partnership with the school district and they've, they've added additional lighting to some of their fields and we'll, those sort of fit under the joint use agreement we have with the school district we'll, which will provide more hours. But I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of the, the efforts to do more of that. Yeah. Hey, hey, Susan, I know I don't want to rush you but we got four more departments after you. So. I only have 30 more slides. <laughs> I know. I know how many right. slides. I'll go quickly. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. But I'm happy to follow up more on those issues as well. Um, and then in terms of, of um, how we do this work, so we can't do it alone. Uh, I, I keep saying we have one of the best parks and recreation systems in the country, and part of that is because we've enjoyed a tremendous amount of support from the community, from the elected officials, from the voters, uh, and of course through all of our partners. We have some, some, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of partners, and this is just one uh, short highlighted list. Uh, I will call out the Associated Recreation Council is our our nonprofit partner that actually does much of our programming in our community centers, and they really are a key partner and, and really well aligned with our mission. Um, we we also have been doing much uh, a great deal of partnership with all of our sister agencies, whether it's uh, preschool classrooms in our in our community centers or work with the libraries and and uh, others in our programming. Uh, so we're just really really pleased uh, and, and feel fortunate to have this. And and I will just also call out we have a an incredibly robust volunteer core of folks who tens of thousands of individuals who. Work Work both, you know, as, as volunteer coaches in our community centers or forest stewards in our parks, um, but we can't do the work without them, and we really appreciate that. Um, and then, in terms of very quickly uh, on our programming, um, we we do lots and lots of programming, uh, uh, literally for the entire you know the entire lifespan of our residents and and, and their abilities. Um, and and uh, frankly, I, I, I think we, we we changed lives. You know, one quick um, uh, uh, sort of narrative here. Uh, just last summer, we had a situation where we were just out of the blue called by uh, one of the local corporations uh, to to receive a grant to provide additional programming. Um, and and we we didn't apply for it. We weren't looking for it. And we found out the reason it came to us is because the person who was in charge of of doling out this money or, or figure, helping out where this money was going to go is someone who had participated in our programming in one of our community centers and and. and and remembered the, the positive impact that that had on her life and really immediately went, well, we should put this in Parks and Recreation. So uh, just a, a small example of how, how we changed those lives. Um, in terms of the way we're structured, uh, and, and this is sort of the probably the drier part of the conversation, so I'll go very quickly. You know, we have uh, several divisions. This work all is divided by there. So the superintendent's office, which is policy and direction, our finance has all of the, the things you can imagine, budget and accounting, et cetera. Our parks and environment division is our largest division with over 300 FTEs, and these are the folks that are out there day to day uh, maintaining our parks, cleaning our parks, mowing the lawns, mowing the fields, et cetera. Uh, our facilities division that, that includes plumbers and 
and HVAC folks and, and painters, et cetera, that are out there making sure that these buildings and these facilities, we actually have over 500 individual building structures in the system, which is, which is pretty robust to say the least, and these folks do a, a, a phenomenal job keeping these things um, in the best possible condition. Uh, I talked about our recreation division, which includes programming as, in community centers as well as our aquatic facilities. Uh, and then our enterprise partnerships and community division is one that, that is, is uh, poised for growth. And the idea here is to leverage outside resources, uh, both from our community partners, from our volunteers, grants, sponsorships, and things like that. So we're trying to build more of that so that we can generate additional revenue to support the work that we do. And then fin finally, our planning and development division uh, manages pretty robust capital improvement projects. Uh, program and, and they're just focused on on time on budget delivery of, of a whole lot of I think we have over 300 active capital projects right now um, uh, and then just generally we have almost about nine about 950 full-time uh, staff members and about 1250 part-time seasonal folks that are that are Very part well. of the team I was wondering, um, where does the Conservation Corps fit? And the Conservation Corps actually was moved. It was in planning development. We moved it over to the EPIC division because EPIC is anchored at Magnuson, which is also where the Conservation Corps is anchored. So we want to give them additional support there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's now uh, your EPIC is enterpri uh, the enterprise. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, 30-plus-year-old uh, program, uh, putting uh, folks at work getting them uh, um, into uh, jobs that can lead to careers. Um, I just want to flag my interest, as I've mentioned to you before, um, in exploring, and I recognize the um, some of the challenges, but I believe that they can be overcome um, as it relates to council's uh, funding of the mobile pit stop program. Uh, which is um, our mobile uh, uh, restroom facilities. Um, in other cities that have a mobile pit stop program, um, they, they staff those facilities, and they staff those facilities uh, with, uh, particular, with, with a population of, uh, of workers that is very aligned mm -hmm. um, with the population of folks that we employ through the Conservation uh, Corps. So I uh, just want to flag that that might be an opportunity uh, for continued partnership um, with some of our other departments, whether or not it's SPU or HSD that is going to be um, uh, taking the lead on that. We'll, we'll no. see, but just want to... Yeah, no, thank there. you. And, and, you know, I, we're also very interested in growing that program. I think part of the the calculus and figuring out how to grow it is is making sure that there's work for these folks to do and some funding for that. So, so welcome any opportunities to do more of that. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move along. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and very quickly, just a snapshot of who our staff is uh, in terms of gender and ethnic breakdown. We've got a pretty diverse staff. Uh, the majority of our staff identifies as something other than white. Uh, our gender, uh, we have almost 60% male and 40% um, female. Um, and then jumping into our budget, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, council member, at your opening, we have a, a, our 2020 adopted budget is $262 million. Uh, of that, uh, $175 million is operating and uh, $87 million is capital, and this sort of shares, shows you the, the various uh, sources. I will highlight that um, when, when we go out and we talk a lot about our budget and people talk about the park district, uh, I think it's important to note that the park district, while critical and important for our work, uh, represents roughly 20% of our total budget. Uh, uh, so when we launched uh, our strategic planning process, it wasn't just about Park District, it was about all of our operations, and so that will be embedded in this. Um, and then finally, as we look to 2020 and beyond, um, you know, happy to answer any questions about our work plan. So these are the, sort of the values that, that have been driving our planning and our work planning for our divisions. Uh, and, and very quickly, this is the idea and, and reminder that we, we work to we serve people, um, that we prioritize equity, uh, also that we're a part of a citywide solution to the challenges. So the work that we do to support other agencies is a key part of what we do uh, as a Parks and Recreation Department, uh, and making sure that we recognize that our city is growing and changing in, in, in many ways, and we want to make sure that we are responsive to that. Um, and, and the last couple of things here on, on the engagement, we work for the residents, so we need to make sure that we're always deliberately and, and continually engaging with folks to make sure that we're providing what their needs are um, and, and making sure that we honor our responsibility as, as uh, stewards of this land and mitigate the impacts of climate change. And then we do it all in a way that's, that's focused on professionalism and excellence and best practice. 
Um, Jesus, you want to, you can do it or I can do it, but I prefer you do it just quickly because I know Councilmember Peterson will do it Monday. Um, we're going to start the six year planning. If you want to just mention the three dates and locations, or I have it in front of me. Do you want to do it or you want Yeah, me? unfortunately, I gave you my Okay, I'll, I will tell you. I um, we're going to start, um, as you know, in 2014, we approved the Seattle Parks District and we're going to start our six year plan. And the first um, community meeting will be at the Del Ridge Community Center Monday, March 2nd from 6 to 8. The second one will be at the Lake City Community Center Thursday, March 5th from 6 to 8. And the third one will be at the Van Assault, did I say that right? Van, Van Assault Community Center Saturday, March 7th. Um, you'll get notice of this. <coughs> Councilmember Peterson will make a formal announcement again Monday because I won't be here Monday. But we've been um, working on this, so I'm excited. So we are last year to put this last six year plan together yep. and how we're going to spend these funds and where we're going to look at uh, capital needs and operating needs. Yep. All yeah, right. Thank Starting you. In district one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't know about that, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah we're excited. Oh, I, thought uh, meant, I thought you meant money wise. <laughs> we're excited and our, our oversight committee and our board of park commissioners is excited to hear from our, our residents and community members about uh, where they'd like to see us uh, move forward with this next cycle of the park district. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have you back. You want to read the second item in? Item two, Office of the Waterfront and Civic Projects Overview and 2020 Work Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. We got our water folks friends here. That's right. Hi, Hi. Marshall, Dory. Have a seat. You guys want to introduce yourselves and then we'll, um, it's 1034, so. Again, I told Nagin, I don't think departments can do 15 minutes, but we'll give it a try. I don't want to really rush you, but go ahead and do introductions. And they I could do 15 minutes if, if we would just <laughs> for the chances of that happening. Hi, I'm Dory Costa. I'm the finance manager for the Office of the Waterfront. And I'm Jessica Murphy. I'm the construction manager for our office. Hey, Jessica. Good morning, Marshall Foster. I'm the director of the office. Great. Who's kicking us off? You, Marshall? Oh. I'm going to kick us off. Yeah. Good morning, council members. Thank you for having us in. Um, we're excited to kind of give you an overview of the Office of the Waterfront and Civic Projects and a bit of a look ahead to what uh, you can expect to see in 2020. I do want to add that you changed your title and you did steal my title, some of my title. Civic Projects, Waterfront, that was in mine, just so. We're flattery, what is it, how is it said? Uh, you just stealing is the me. highest form of flattery, maybe? Or Something it could like be that. colonization, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making a joke. Go ahead. So um, what we're going to do is kind of walk you through, you know, the context for the Waterfront program. Our office <laughs> is a pretty unusual um, office within the city. We're only 11 FTE. Um, so probably one of the smallest uh, in the city. And we were created with a really specific purpose, um, which was to implement the vision for Waterfront Seattle. Um, what you have on the screen is a footprint of our program area, and I'll talk about some of the details of that. Um, really, we started when the decision was made about how to replace the Alaskan Way Viaduct. You'll recall all the discussion we had uh, in the late aughts and a couple of public votes culminated in the decision to build the deep board tunnel. And starting at that time and moving forward, um, we really built a partnership on a couple of different fronts. A partnership with a, uh, we created a civic committee called the Central Waterfront Partnerships Committee that started working intensively with SDOT, with the Planning and Development Office, with uh, Parks on how to envision the waterfront that could be created when the viaduct was removed. And we also built a public agency partnership with the state of Washington, Department of Transportation, Ferries, and King County Metro to really plan for the transportation future on the waterfront. And what we're doing today, which we'll talk about, we're actually now under construction, is really executing a decade later the, the foundational, you know, the commitments and the partnership that really started at that time, going back to, to those decisions. So on the screen, you see in the yellow color, really the footprint of what we call Waterfront Seattle. That is the viaduct lands that have now been removed. We all got to watch the viaduct come down over the last year. And in its place, we are now beginning construction of 20 acres of parks and public infrastructure that really serves, obviously, the downtown community, but it really serves the whole city and the region. Um, I'm gonna talk about the different elements of it in a moment. 
There's some very important related projects that our office is involved in, but that we're not directly responsible for. Uh, the replacement of Coleman Dock by the Washington State Ferries, uh, that's a mega project in its own right. Uh, the re replacement of the Elliott Bay Seawall, which was finished by SDOT uh, several years ago. Jessica actually was uh, part of the, the leadership of that project. And then a couple of uh, joint development projects with nonprofit partners, Pike Place Market and its construction of what they call Market Front, which was finished about two years ago. And then uh, in the future, the expansion of the Seattle Aquarium, uh, which we've talked about here at the council in the past. So, I'm going to guess most of you uh, remember the public process we had around Waterfront Seattle. From about 2010 through 2013, we had a very large citywide conversation around the future of the waterfront. Um, a series of public events, very large scale, uh, driven by what could we do with that 20 acres of parks and public space? How could we create a democratic and inclusive vision for reconnecting our entire community back to Elliott Bay. That was really the foundation of it. Uh, we had a series of large-scale public events. We had community conversations in literally every uh, corner of Seattle, really focused on how can Seattle have that great, I don't wanna say central park, but you know, that downtown park that will support every neighborhood in the city and create a place for programming, for community events, for celebrations of um, our city in a way and in a space that we haven't had in the past because of the presence of the viaduct. Um, you know, if you go back, sort of looking at the city's history, there has been talk and clamoring for uh, reclaiming that waterfront really ever since shortly after the viaduct was built that was discussed. And so in a lot of ways, the Waterfront Seattle program was an opportunity for the community to come together um, and really be able to kind of really see that vision realized. Um, I won't go through the, the details of the, the level of engagement, but we had literally hundreds of events and tens of thousands of people participating both in person and online in the development of that vision. Early on in the process, um, city council and the mayor, there was a whole series of, of legislative actions that have really guided this from the very early days. Probably one of the most important ones that took place was the creation of the guiding principles for Waterfront Seattle. You can see those on the screen here. I won't go through all of them. Um, those really created the compass and the guiding light for every step of the program. As we move through that public process, these ideas, waterfront for all, which is really about that inclusive vision for everyone getting to use and enjoy this waterfront. Sustainable design, which was really represented in the seawall design and the nearshore habitat enhancement that, enhancements that it provides, as well as with what we're doing with the waterfront, uh, the full waterfront park in terms of stormwater management and removing some of our stormwater overflow events that happen on the bay. Reconnecting the whole city to the waterfront, um, and we'll talk about how that, how that plays out, and really telling the story of the city's history, um, as well as looking forward in terms of the cultural um, elements that are included in the design. And then something, you know, access and mobility, you know, all these key ideas, something that's been especially important as we've watched this play out is the importance of having uh, a bold vision that can adapt over time. You know, we had to deal with the situation with Bertha, uh, when Bertha was stuck, um, we had to endure that and work through that creatively with the state. We've had several major shifts in the design, responding to cost, responding to schedule, and changing priorities. And I think all through that, we've been able to keep the progression um, of forward motion on this program across, I think we're now in our fourth, depending on how you do the math, fourth or sixth mayoral administration. Um, so we've had a lot of longevity um, over time. So here you can see the detail of what we are now starting to build. This is the capital program that was established shortly after the public planning process that I described in uh, 2012 and then 2013, there was a series of, of key actions that took place here at the council, which formed the waterfront program officially, established it in the city's capital improvement plan, and also called for an unprecedented level of public private partnership on the funding of that waterfront vision. And that's where we introduced the idea of 
a major philanthropic partnership with Friends of Waterfront Seattle, which is a nonprofit organization that was then created and is now in the process of raising about $110 million for the program. And also to um, advance um, the concept of a, of a local improvement district that would assess downtown properties for the special benefit associated with the park improvements. And as I think you all know, um, the council did act to form the LID last year. We're not gonna go into that in a lot of detail today, but obviously that's a major issue at council this year is the final steps on the LID. In terms of the, the elements of the program, um, the, the backbone of this entire effort is the replacement of Alaskan Way. So that is taking place from King Street all the way north up to uh, Pine Street, and then north from there, the creation of a, a new street that doesn't exist today uh, called Elliott Way that connects from Alaskan Way up to Belltown and to Elliott and Western Avenues. A long linear promenade, which is a park promenade that will run from King Street all the way north to Pike Place Market. That's really the backbone of the whole project. The replacement of Waterfront Park and Pier 62, which are two existing public parks over water, part of Jesus's park system that he was just talking about, which have been in, in need of replacement for some time. And actually the first phase of that um, is the replacement of Pier 62, which is just a couple months away from completion. And then a series of east-west connections. I talked about this idea of, of connecting the, the whole city and the center city neighborhoods to this new waterfront. You'll see these fingers that connect in in Pioneer Square and South Downtown. Uh, a major new connection between the Pike and Pine Corridor all the way down to the waterfront um, with what we call the Overlook Walk, which will connect Pike Place Market to the waterfront, as well as improvements to Pike and Pine Streets, where our program is reaching all the way east up to uh, Capitol Hill, actually, through the Pike Pine Corridor to improve those streets. And then finishing off the Bell Street Park, if you're familiar with that in Belltown, the last two blocks of that will be finished by our program to connect it down to the waterfront. Yeah, Councillor Mosqueda. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So I was really proud to work with the chair to help support this effort and the vision here. Um, and in saying that, I also know we have continued to address questions around equity and access. Uh, I believe this is a park for all of Seattle, but there is still questions about how is all of Seattle going to benefit from this um, new redevelopment. So can you talk a little bit about the equity analysis that you've incorporated into this full kind of spectrum of what's gonna happen on the sure. waterfront? Yeah, absolutely. And if there's any specific features of the project that you have incorporated in response to the equity concerns that have been raised in the last few years based on their feedback um, that would be helpful for us to hear. Yeah, yeah so this has been a really uh, important topic for us. We did an analysis um, with the Friends of Waterfront Seattle mm -hmm. over the last year and a half. And the focus of that has been how to take this idea of the waterfront for all and inclusive participation in that project and really identify what are all the strategies that we're using that deliver on that concept. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the key things that we're focusing on in partnership with them. What we heard consistently through the public engagement was that we needed to create spaces and venues in these parks that were comfortable and attractive to every community so that it did not read and feel like a downtown only space. Obviously it's gonna serve downtown users, but we would, proactively invest in bringing every neighborhood into the project. So what we have essentially uh, established with Friends of Waterfront Seattle, they are our programming and operating, operating partner. Um, so they're working hand in glove with the Parks Department and our office, is they are directly investing in helping communities come in to use these new parks. And that's scaling up as we're bringing the spaces online. So for example, they've been for the last two years working with us in Waterfront Park to go ahead and start experimenting with how they can do the programming and activation. They are providing direct support to a variety of different organizations to do events in the park. Some of the examples um, that they've, you know, things that they're experimenting with, um, they've worked with an organization called 206 Zulu in Rainier Valley to bring youth participation, hip hop, music and art into the space. Um, they're working with an organization called K-pop, which is focused on Korean pop, if you know that music, which was a total experiment. They actually funded helping that 
there's an incredible kind of under the radar organization of people who are engaged in that um, and actually help to, to fund them to come in and do events. And they're scaling that up in a variety of ways as they're this summer, this spring and summer, they'll be taking on Pier 62 and bringing events there. Um, they're actually working with Africatown to bring them into Pier 62 and also working with um, the tribal community on Salmon Homecoming and helping to support that organization, that event scaling up in the parks. It's not um, a sort of a baked recipe. They're really in a experimentation, trying to see what works and bringing people in. The other thing I want to just highlight really quick that we're excited about is we know the waterfront is a great venue for small business. There's a huge amount of foot traffic, obviously the tourism, but as well, you know, a huge local population that uses the waterfront. We are, um, as part of our partnership with Friends, um, setting up a small business incubator program, and we've been working closely with an organization called Ventures, you may know, to really make sure that we are using, we're not creating a lot of retail space, we're creating a couple, that those are opportunities to incubate small businesses from uh, disadvantaged communities in Seattle. And so Ventures is the partner to Friends to make sure that we can do that with those spaces. Those are just a couple examples. Um, so I think I'm going to move on from the design and just talk a little bit about construction and then our funding. And I just want to give a shout out to Jessica Murphy here. I think a lot of you know Jessica. She has been very involved in a lot of the major construction in Seattle for the DOT. Also Angela Brady, who couldn't be with us today, who have stood up a construction management team, um, which is actually, I would say, three quarters of our effort easily at this point is the day-to-day -day delivery. So I'm just going to highlight, and Jessica can go into more detail, this is what it looks like on Alaskan Way. So over the past few months, we've essentially taken over the construction where you saw the state taking down the viaduct. The crews you see out there now are now Waterfront Seattle uh, teams. Uh, we're doing a, a variety of utility replacements out of the gate, uh, putting in new, new transmission and distribution lines for City Light new stormwater um, and water systems for SPU, and then the drainage system for the new Alaskan Way. That's what you see going on right now on Alaskan Way. A very important early piece of our project is to connect Columbia Street, where we used to have the on-ramp to the viaduct. That is going to very soon be opened as a major pathway for regional transit. Uh, I'm a West Seattleite. I ride the rapid ride. If others do, uh, that bus has been on a temporary route for several months, and very shortly it will be re-established on Columbia, which will improve the transit speed and reliability very quite a bit. Very shortly, being within very the next shortly six months or less. With, uh, within the month. Within the month. That's yeah. that is. We'll be very announcing short. the We're date very shortly. Same language. Of what yeah. Very yeah. Within means. within I the month. I love it. That's yeah. So, <laughs> District yeah. one. I'm a little concerned about, but. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, we we all. We have a lot of West Seattleites in our office. Just just happens to be it wasn't planned, um, and and we're as motivated as anybody to get that open. We're uh, excited. About rapid that. ride uh, riders will really appreciate it. That's yeah, fantastic. yeah, it's going to be a lot uh, more reliable than the current situation. Um, pier 62, I mentioned. This is where we used to have our summer nights on the pier. This is a picture of some of our our contractors team out there. It's starting to get very close to completion. That's the new railing, the new deck, um, and so we're very excited to be opening that later in the spring. Um, the Friends of Waterfront Seattle will really be in partnership with the Parks Department operating that new pier um, as soon as it opens. You know, I just wanted to emphasize as we leave construction how important it is to our team that we have a really proactive plan to preserve access. This is a diagram that shows you how we manage pedestrian access through the construction zone. We've got Coleman Dock, we've got the water taxi, we've got all the transit movements. And so this is something that Jessica and her team focus on every single day um, intensively is keeping those pathways open. We do have temporary closures where we have to close certain crosswalks or shift people. We work really intensively on the signage and on the communicating ahead of time to both the traveling public but also to our property owners. And we are also working hard at keeping that mainline Alaskan way open for traffic throughout the construction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is an area that I used to bike quite a bit, and um, 
I mentioned this to the SDOT director as well. There is no temporary bike lane that appears to be on the street. And given the high foot traffic that occurs on our new uh, sidewalk there, which is gorgeous, we do like that light can go in now for the yeah. um, marine uh, life that's underneath the pier, but there's not a safe place to bike. And I see that you say multi-use trail open during summer, um, but that also is not exactly a, a bike lane for commuters. Um, what I asked of our friends at SDOT is that a temporary um, bike lane be added to the um, street so that people who are using biking as a commuting option can stay on the street and not be, it, you know, trying to weave in and out of uh, tourists and pedestrians that are walking on the sidelines there. I understand that once it's finally completed, you're going to have a great bike lane. That's a not under you know, question here. But it is pretty scary down there right now, especially as people line up to get on to 99 South. Um, and I'm wondering if you've heard that concern and if there is still the ability to add not just a Shero because it's, it's really con congested down there, but a narrow bike lane so that people know where their avenue is. Yeah, no, we're very aware of that concern. I think the core issues around space mm -hmm. and how do we provide something that's a safe facility mm -hmm. while we also have the room to build the project. Do you wanna say a little bit, Jessica? Yeah, I'll just add that you're right, the bike, bicycle facilities have been inadequate for a long time. The multi-use path has served that purpose for a long time, and we did enjoy for a while during seawall construction the somewhat quieter road underneath the viaduct that I think um, the cycling community did appreciate. Now with Alaskan Way, four lanes, very busy. Uh, we are trying to maintain that access to that multi-use path, uh, and certainly that dedicated space throughout construction, but Space is a constraint. We're trying to make that optimal. We're actually in the process of putting out some more reflectors on some of those temporary poles that have the barrels around them just to make sure the visibility is good on that mm -hmm. path, make sure we're not encroaching on its width and it is eight feet wide. Uh, but we will also look forward to getting that permanent facility in and we'll work with our partners at SDOT to see if what we can do on the interim. Okay, and then lastly, just on this topic as well, um, another item that I've mentioned to SDOT is the need for more bike corrals down, especially by the ferry terminal. Um, there have been a number of people who I think have been excited to try their, our rental bikes that are available, and unfortunately we lost one, but there is still a jump bike out there. Um, I would love for us to see a bike corral, because right now those bikes get parked right on the sidewalk, and it, they're a you know, danger for those with disabilities or vision impairments, and they're also just a danger for pedestrians and other cyclists in the area. Um, so that could be potentially an, a pretty quick fix as we get everything else. Um, I know this is not our, the, the entire presentation, but just because yeah. it happens no, to be part totally of this fair. slide. I mean, we've actually asked that question okay. yeah. too. Um, it makes a lot of sense. The challenge that that they've found at SDOT with this issue generally is how to get the users to use those corrals. Because that, yeah. that's part of the, the thing with the, with the bike sharing is it's right. just designed to be jumping. But there is none around. right now. And right. especially with our new, um, I always call it the foot ferry, the water taxi. Um, it's a beautiful facility down there, but still people come and they don't have a place to put their bikes. So that would mm -hmm. be something I'd love to follow up with you guys yeah. on if you can, we can definitely check in follow now up that on we that. have the new water taxi area. And I think um, I'll hold my other comments about my desire for water taxi year round, maybe bring that <laughs> over to our friends at King County. But um, that would be a great way for more people to enjoy the waterfront. Uh, right now we have limited hours during the winter and I think it's just a missed opportunity for midday tourists and families and weekend families for them to come back and forth um, from all of our friends who live in West Seattle. No, it's a great, it's a great service. Sure. Okay, so um, trying to keep keep to schedule. I know you have a lot to lot to hear from different departments. Quick snapshot of our schedule. The key thing to know is that we are well underway now. Like I said, a few months in, we will be hard at work on construction into early 2024. Um, so we have about four years of total construction. The roadway will be the first element that will open, the first major element, which will open ahead of that. We're still working through the details of that scheduling. Um, it won't be that everything opens all at once in 2024, and we, you will see, as I mentioned before, Pier 62 will open in the short term later this spring. Um, there are also, you see some of the other related projects, the Coleman Dock rebuild, mid-23, obviously, you know, more to come if they, if they hit that target, and the aquarium's construction is on the tail end of the waterfront construction. It has been important to us to get the new surface road open um, 
as they begin their work as well. This is basically our work plan. Yeah. And that is that the next really is. four, because if we were looking back at the last four, we got it done. So yeah. good job. Well yep. done, all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. $728 million total budget. This is essentially the, the capital program that you see. You can see the, the funding partnership I mentioned at the beginning, uh, $260 million of city funds, uh, about $200 million of state funding. That's through the Alaskan Way Viaduct Replacement Program. That's part of the funding that also included the Deep War Tunnel and other related projects, $110 million of private philanthropy, and the $160 million local improvement district. Yeah, we should really give a big shout out to Friends of the Waterfront. They've been front and center with us in raising the 110 million. Um, it's just been phenomenal watching the public-private partnership on that. Yeah. So again, well done. And they have, um, you know, we could come and talk. They could give you an update on their progress. They're doing a great job of also broadening their organization right now. They're really staffing up for programming, for community outreach. They actually go out and do a lot of outreach with us now in community around how to bring people to the project. Like I mentioned, funding you know community partnerships to get people down and join the waterfront. And they're right now um, standing up their operating team. So they're actually you know, bringing in staff who's dedicated focuses on park operations. And they're working really closely with the Parks Department on the selection of that team right now. We're gonna have more public restrooms down there, correct? We are. We're yeah. gonna have a, several new public restrooms. Uh, we'll have an anchor restroom right at Waterfront Park, mm -hmm. right by the aquarium, that will actually be a staffed restroom, mm -hmm. which will help keep it safe and attractive to use. Absolutely, so. thank you. Uh, I'm not gonna dive into the LID. You're gonna spend more time on this uh, at, at City Council this year. Um, but this is just a snapshot of what the LID area is and some of the key facts and figures associated with that. And most importantly is what you can expect going forward. We had our first uh, of a, a series of public hearings uh, on Tuesday this week in the final phase of the LID, which is the um, confirmation of the final assessment role. We're anticipating that council will consider action on that in June of this year after we've gone through the hearing examiner process. And then there's a, a final action uh, regarding the bond ordinance to actually issue bonds against that funding source that would take place uh, in the fall of this year. So really our, our major topic uh, with this committee, and we're happy that we're getting, we get to continue working directly with this committee, will be around the LID this year. About the civic projects? Yes, and, and other civic projects, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the Office of the Waterfront in a nutshell. So. Is there any questions we have from my colleagues? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so as we know, there's a beautiful old structure down there next to the new water taxi entrance. I don't know how old it is, but it looks original. Um, is, is part of our redesign going to be incorporating that into some sort of park element? And for folks that don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you can explain yeah. its origination. Yep. It's the Washington Street boat landing. So really cool building. That was the original home of the uh, Harbor Master. And uh, basically that building fell into disrepair. We actually just finished the restoration of it. So you've probably noticed it looks great now. It's been completely refurbished. It's a landmark building, lighting, you know, all the steel's been redone. Um, the building is fenced off right now. It will ultimately, once the park is built around it, it is part of the promenade. And so that building will be a center for how people arrive to the waterfront from Pioneer Square. And um, I mentioned this partnership around small business incubator, food and beverage. There's a small, what's called the Harbor Master's office, which is that small space. That will actually be a small food and beverage, you know, probably coffee, ice cream, those types of things. And we'll be actually looking for an opportunity to bring in a partner to work with us there. And last thing I'll say is that if you look right next to it, we have the um, habitat bench that was built as part by Jessica and her team as part of the seawall and um, the waterfront, and that's actually a near shore habitat restoration that was part of our partnership with the tribal community to improve salmon habitat right there. So it's gonna be a very cool part of the waterfront right there. You can't really use it yet because it's not, there's not enough space to really start programming, but as soon as the park is built around it, all the fences come down and okay. we'll be able to use it. Marshall, we handle the concession contracts, right? Parks handles those. We're not gonna go through the waterfront piece like we do at the water taxi place, the marination. We, do you handle those contracts or do we Those will them? be handled by Friends of Waterfront Seattle. Oh, they're gonna handle those ones, okay. Yeah. But we'll be involved in those ones as well through the, we'll be setting through up, the MOU? 
the uh, license agreements for That's friends, right. which will say what our expectations are of them right. as far as those concessions. Right, and it will so, have the same equity lens that we do on the, all the other um, small businesses and in incubation. Yeah. Which we've there, been doing. There, there's a whole set of uh, commitments that this committee helped to shape around the first license agreement, which is for Pier 62, which we looked at here last year, around Friends' commitment to public free programming. What does she like to call it? Hella free? Yes, like, hella free. That's what uh, Heidi Hughes, their ED, likes to call it. <laughs> um, and how they're basically... And super free. Super so free. So you can't Sorry, get any more free than that. Super, super free. free. So they're very committed to you know, free and open public events bringing, you know, community into the way that they staff and, you know, provide I guess the point I want to make is that we put Friends of the Waterfront and the Aquarium and all those folks through the same race and social justice lens as we do everything else because that is our mandate. So we make sure that all those contracts are representative of the people that live in the city. Correct? Okay. Exactly right. Let's Real wrap quick. up. Go ahead, Councilor. Real quick question. The bonds you referenced, will they be paid back with, what's the source of funding to pay the debt service on the bonds? So we have uh, we, we're using two kinds of bonds. We have a set of bonds that we use that are LTGO bonds that are issued by the city that are paid back with commercial parking tax that's being used for transportation improvements. But then we also have the local improvement district will... Um, Property owners can pay over time, and so we issue bonds that are backed by the local improvement district revenues. And so those, once the local improvement district final assessments are, are finalized and approved, um, with the city will sell those bonds, and they'll be backed by those revenues uh, from the people who pay the assessments. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Jessica. Thanks, Dory. Thanks, Marshall. We'll see you again, as always. Yep. Always a pleasure. I know. Come down and see construction. And come down and see I think down, I was down at the market Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. It looks great. Yeah, it looks great. Good job. OK, bye, you guys. All right, one reason. Item three, the Seattle Public Library Overview and 2020 Work Plan. We have Marcellus, MT. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's good I, to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you. We're happy to be with you in 2020. Uh, I'm MT. I'm your chief librarian, and I'm joined by... I'm, is this on? Allison Schwartz. I'm the Community Partnerships and Government Relations Lead. So we're happy to meet with you and talk about some of the work that's occurring at the library and introduce you to how we're organized and structured. Welcome back, Councilmember Mosqueda. We're also happy the levy passed. Uh, we are very happy that the levy passed. Thanks to the council for their support with that. And we're going to touch upon that in a minute. Right. Um, we're ready to go. So as many of you probably know, our mission is to bring information. I don't think it's up. Oh, it's on this screen. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Let me find your libraries in that picture. Uh, <laughs> I could not do it. <laughs> I'm going to have to call Seattle Channel. Um, so if, if you have printed. We have it printed. OK. Well, we'll move that route and quickly go from there. Um, I will be speaking from each of the pages as much as I can, but first of all, I'm on page two just so you'll know where I'm starting from. Um, our mission is to bring people, information, and ideas together, and I think we do that quite well. We have lots of opportunities to so engage, and I'll be sharing those as we move forward. Uh, we promote joyful, lifelong learning. We welcome everyone through our doors. Um, it's easy when you think of libraries to think of books, but we do so much more than that. Sure and do. <laughs> we really do. We bring, um, have lots of programming, and there's a statistic later in the 
uh, slide about that, but just we are so much more than books, and people are starting to realize that, and that is very helpful to us. And in fact, we have a gift for you that we're going to give you right now. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> just me, or do these no, guys the get one too? No, the whole committee gets it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you so, got our books for the year. Like oh, you this do... is not. This is oh, a new this one. Is this is a new one. one. We'll be back with that one as well. But we're bringing you a book called Palace for the People, and it talks about the role of libraries in cities and how we are gathering spaces for that. And we think it's really apropos for what we do as a library in terms of bringing people information and ideas together. You may have heard of him, the author. He's been to Seattle a couple of times to speak and uh, really draws a big crowd. I know that the Library Foundation had him in uh, last year, so we're really Is that Mayor Pete? Yes, that is. So um, <laughs> endorses, endorsements <laughs> everywhere. And we even had Mayor Pete in the library um, two years ago, one of our largest attendance crowds ever. Um, he really had a big showing. I guess I wasn't invited to that, so uh, I wouldn't we know. Will, we, will correct a, <laughs> we will correct that. We will make sure that you're receiving all of those. Thank you, Marcellus. Of course. Um, but again, we provide access to information and ideas and provide programming all the way from birth through older adulthood. So we're really excited about that. Cool. We have 27 locations with 26 neighborhood libraries across the city in each of your districts. Um, Central, is a, Central, which is right down the street from you, is a service hub for circulation, security, and maintenance, but it's also where we plan and develop the programs carried out by our 673 ambassadors who work for the system. There are seven regions that map closely to your council districts, and each region collaborates with community members and partners to identify and respond to their community priorities. Thank you for putting in the council districts. That's new. Yes, we did that, and we're going to, I think it's, we're going to go in and make sure that we have the libraries on there, so anytime you see it, you know the libraries <laughs> in your region uh, district, so we will do that for you. Uh, just to give you some of the numbers of our system, um, we are a very, very busy system. System. We had about 12 million items circulated last year, which means we're one of the leading libraries in the world uh, with circulation. We had uh, 17 million visits, both in person and online last year, and we had 2,535,000 um, Wi-Fi and computer access sessions during the course of the year. As you might imagine, many people come into our libraries to use our high-speed Wi-Fi access, and because of that, um, that number of usage or that usage is increasing, but we're also seeing a decent number of people who are still using the computers that we have in each of our libraries. Marcel's two quick mm -hmm. questions. Where are we at nationally? Mm -hmm. So we are at the top. I would have to get the number. We are normally leading in per capita in CERCs per year uh, across the world. I think Hong Kong comes in second, and I just haven't looked at the numbers recently. Okay. And and you have to recognize that we're a city system, not comparing with a county system that has a different per capita. And we, have, we haven't measured yet how many people are coming back now that we've removed the fine issue. We are, are expecting the first report on that in February. So Good. we I'm are, looking forward we are to excited that. about that. We will bring that to you. What we have heard is that people are bringing books back, uh, which is the good thing because there was the concern that people would not return their books if they didn't have to pay a fine. Councilor Mosqueda returned her books. <laughs> I do have a little anecdote about this. <laughs> sure. um, so I have a friend who uh, she was mentioning that she was on parental leave and uh, she and her husband were going with one income for six months. Mm -hmm. And she went to the library and they told her that she had a $60 fine and she's, you know, mi middle income. Sure. And that was a hardship for them mm -hmm. because they were on one income at the time. So she was like, if it was a hardship for me, imagine how hard it is for folks who are, you know, really struggling month to month to pay the bills. And mm -hmm. she's said once they said that I could come and my fine would be waived, we went every day with our new kiddos. Wow. And so it really brought them back into the library. It is bringing people back and we're really excited about that. And it's amazing how many stayed away just because of that one thing and we weren't aware yeah. that that was the barrier to their The return. Western world didn't collapse as no. everyone thought. No, it did not. Because we waive fines and fees. That is so true. And we are quite proud to join. There are probably about 60 to 75 libraries doing it now. Chicago and San Francisco coming on board in Los yeah. Angeles. Didn't Chicago have like a 250,000 increase? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Phenomenal. 
I read, I read all that stuff, Marcellus. I know you don't toes. think I read it, but I do. You do. You do. You're <laughs> keeping me on my toes. So, yes, I do, Mr. Nellums. He's out there <laughs> laughing at me. Uh, so there are some additional statistics in the slide, but we're really excited about that. The last one I'll show you is the one where we have 101 uh, books and materials circulated to homebound. Um, disabled senior citizens in daycares. And you may remember about two years ago, we revamped our uh, mobile book service to get into the neighborhoods where they were disadvantaged or where uh, the economic resources weren't there. And so we're really proud to see how that increase has uh, carried forward. Thank you. Just as a reminder, uh, we're set up, we are a city department of the city of Seattle, but we operate a little bit differently from most of the departments who report into council. Um, we have a five member board that's appointed by mayor and city council, who then in turn hire the executive director and chief librarian. And we're structured into four areas. We have institutional and strategic advancement, which covers um, planning for the future, but also communications and marketing, employee relations, which is HR, administrative services, which is our budget and finance offices, and then library programs and services, which is everything you see when you walk in any one of our libraries. Our funding is structured that we will have, thanks to the levy passing, a 91.7 million budget yes. for 2020. That is very helpful to the work that we need. And you'll also note that we receive about 64% from general fund, 28% from the levy, which will probably show about 32% adjusted for the increase, and then a small um, decrease in the general fund, but the other is about 8%, but it will all true out with about three percentage points of each other. Um, as we share it, the levy passed, um, and some of the promises that we made to the public are shown here. No more late fees. That started January 2nd, and we're really excited about that, and we'll be bringing that report back to you in February or March, depending upon when we appear before you again. We've added additional hours at each one of your libraries, so each one of the libraries in your district should have additional hours on Sundays, opening at 12 noon to provide more access to our resources, also recognizing that we also also serve the city as a warming shelter in the winter, so we're proud and happy to do that. We have an increased budget for e-materials. We will be taking on two additional points in June. We will be adding some additional hours in June across seven of our locations, and we should be able to move forward on our early learning expansion um, in, in June of 2020. We also have some new community resource programs for at-risk youth, and that will start June to fall of 2020. And then finally, we have three seismic retrofits that we're working on. And we have um, been looking at how we might enhance the vision of each of those uh, seismic retrofits um, to give the public some additional resources and expectations. But we're just in the early stages of that. And we still have our social worker downtown? We still have our social worker downtown. And the new community resource program will add a full and a part-time um, person with us. One of the things that we're working with right now is that the program that we work through DESC does not have the youth components, so we're having to look for an additional agency to help us with that aspect of it. You can follow up with us on that one online. Oh, that would be great. That. that okay. would be great. Just on that, sure. um, real quick, I was really excited that we were able to get that into the amended um, mm -hmm. levy last year. Thanks to you. Thank you for mm -hmm. your support and to the chair. Mm -hmm. um, it would be helpful to know more as you roll this out where those services are uh, equitably distributed across the city and sort of the feedback that you get. Sure. I'm assuming it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what you really need. Mm -hmm. um, Simultaneous to that conversation around services for youth were the desire to have more um, social service providers at the libraries to help people get connected to jobs and housing, et cetera. Uh, we weren't able to get that included um, to enhance those folks and additional, I think it was uh, security assistance for mm -hmm. folks who are working in the libraries. I know that's something that is a shared priority. So if you have more information about what the need is there, um, so we can proactively work on potentially 
adding to or supplementing what was passed in the levy on those aspects that'd be helpful for later this year. That would be certainly appreciated. I know that um, a, a couple of quick things related to that. Um, certainly having more of a presence to help us address some of the challenges that we're facing in our libraries would be very helpful to us and give some assurance to both our public and our staff, as well as many of our patrons who use us. I say this, someone reminds me every day, many of our daily readers, which is what we call our homeless population, are looking for safe spaces as well, and they know that they'd rather be inside than outside, and so we are always looking looking for opportunities for that. One of the other things that we're looking at, and I will follow up with you, is one of the RCWs, which provides provisions for um, um, the safety of the operators of buses and, book, and things like that. We're trying to add library staff workers oh, to that Oh, we can list. work with you on that one. So we would yeah, do that. Yeah, that's the elevate. Like, we have it for police and firefighters and ambulance drivers. All of them drivers. are covered, but not we, we just did the same thing for the firefighters, I believe. OK. So or ambulance will, drivers. Great. Right, right. Casper Herbo? Yeah, I just want to go back to the um, the additional hours mm -hmm. uh, metric. So um, in the uh, library levy, we promised additional hours, and I think you mentioned that we have rolled out part of that, mm -hmm. and that's the earlier opening. Yes. And next, is it... We're in June, some... uh, we just... I hate saying it publicly, we just settled on mid-June uh, for the date that we will roll out the additional hours at seven of the locations. And those were the second part of the levies request. And so that's for the uh, later hours? That would be the later portion? hours. Yes, okay. that would be the later hours. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And um, when will there be more public information about which of the seven libraries are going to be receiving later hours? So that information we should be able to give to you. So I will go back and find that. But I will, if not, um, we were talking about when we will start the public communication about this, and that will probably come mid-March to April. We're still working with staff Fantastic. on that. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Eagle, yes. um, <laughs> who we speak with very often, and I appreciate uh, the uh, library's uh, responsiveness to their inquiries, are eagerly awaiting to find out. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, uh, you know, it's amazing how many times we don't hear from patrons about their issues. They go straight to you, so we're always appreciative when council forwards those over. Well, it gets do. us on to, Yes, me. you do. <laughs> but we will follow up to make sure that if that announcement of the locate, there are seven locations that are getting extra hours as a part of the levy, and then there were extra hours added to most of the libraries as a result of the extended service. So we will get that for Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Just moving quickly to the next slide. Um, just in case we've never put this in front of you, this is our strategic direction. We do it in three-year increments, and we will be rolling out the 2020 through 2022 in um, March of this year. But it focuses on three areas, what we do for the individual, what we do for the community, and then what we try to do as a library system ourselves to improve upon it. The items in the, in the circles themselves are where we focus our attention. And just so you know, we're moving from a quantitative aspect to a qualitative. So even though it may say something like access, and you can say, oh, we added 600 or 65,000 new library cards to the system, that's just a number what we really try to say when we get put out 65,000 new cards we mean that we're giving a patron access to the collections and books that they have more opportunities for programming they have more opportunities for social services such as the tax assistance help so the number means a lot but it's what they are able to do so we're really trying to um, pivot our conversation about statistics to a qualitative point well, as opposed to a quantitative um, and I think that will show you more of what we're doing did you put up there your um, hotspots? So that, the hotspots are not in that one because, and that would fall, would have fallen in the purple section, uh, what we do for the individual. And it's not there just because we choose different things each year, so I'm not sure what will show up in this coming year. And hotspots, we are doing a great job with it, but you could also see it in the technology and access section okay. of where that occurs. So we'll be rolling that one out, the new update in March. 
We focus on five service priorities, youth and family learning, technology and access, community engagement, Seattle culture and history, and reimagined spaces. And those are the bullet points that were in the green just a moment ago in that circle. And that is areas where we are trying to help the city in any of those areas. So community engagement, if you want to have meetings in our public spaces, uh, we certainly offer that to each of you as council members. Technology and access is where the Wi-Fi occurs, trying to address that gap in the city. City. We're always trying to capture Seattle culture and history, and we have two major landmarks, um, well, one major landmark leaving us right now, which is the Macy's closing, and we're trying to figure out, do we have information on that, just in case someone wanted to come back in a few years and say, what was in this building 10 years ago? What was in it 20 years ago? So those are the types of things that we're always trying to capture and think about. We're not as far along and we're going to retool the Seattle culture and history, but those are the types of things we think about. And then reimagine spaces to make sure that our libraries serve the public in the way that they need. Did you take a position on their moving the archives from Sandpoint out so, of the city? So um, we did not take a formal position in the sense that we had much um, say in it. The state librarian has asked all public libraries in the state to respond to that, and we are writing a letter in support of that as we well. We want to be supportive of that. Yes. I think the information that got back to us um, was a little muddled. I, they thought they were talking about the archives here within the city of Seattle. I didn't know that they were actually talking about that that physical structure at yes. Sandpoint, which I used to go to as a litigator mm -hmm. for tribes to mm -hmm. see the original stuff, mm -hmm. that, that property. So um, if we would, can you work with Nagin on that so we can sure. do do some type of letter or sign on to your letter or have Seattle City Council. Um, that is such a phenomenal resource at Sandpoint with the archives. Um, having that moved, is it to Kansas? They yes. want to move it? Uh, is it or San Francisco? I would have to check again. I thought it was. If you like. yeah, go ahead. Sure. sure. So it's in District 4, and I am in contact with some of the. Um, federal officials on it, you know, you've got the executive branch that's mm -hmm. pushing to mm -hmm. dispose of the property and sell it, uh, and then you have our elected officials who are thankfully trying to preserve it there, and so it's still sort of in their court to preserve, so any sort of s support to get to keep it as an archival building would so that we can have access to those documents oh. that you pointed out. So we'll work with your office? That would be great. Okay. Sure. sure. And we can certainly, um, while I was sitting listening to Jesus and Marshall, um, I had received the first draft of the letter so that I could review it. So I will make sure it's known to both of you. Great. And also, if you're interested, um, I can place you in contact with the city, with the state librarian, um, Cindy Aiden, who is working on this as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. So moving um, on, as you know, the whole city is involved in this, but certainly the library has its fair share of equity work at the library. Um, we prioritize our work centering on equity and a commitment to RSJI. That means leading with race. And just some of the projects that we've led this past year, just so you know, is that we've um, had our community resource specialists uh, drop in at Ballard and Capitol Hill in reference to Councilmember Mosqueda's question. It will also extend, I know that one of the areas that we're focusing on with youth is university um, uh, library because we have a large um, homeless youth population that frequents that library, so we want to be able to serve them better with a um, um, community resource specialist. The other things that we are doing through that service is trying to offer referral services for shelter, mental health, counseling, job training, all of the things that you might think of. Mm -hmm. we, we loan the Wi-Fi hotspots to the homeless encampments so that they have access to that. Those Wi-Fi hotspots are amazing in that each one can serve 15 people at one time. So if we're able to install about four at one time, the 60 people who will have access to the internet while they're in the encampment. So we're really trying to work through that. Really quickly, mm -hmm. did we ever clear up the licensing thing on the e-books? We... <laughs> Fighting about that with them? So... Um, Talk about offline if it's sure. getting more complicated. It, is, it is still a, a wrestle with that publisher. Okay. Yes, it is still right. a wrestle with and that we'll publisher. We'll get right on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the last thing I'll share in the equity work is that we really are trying to push our library staff out into the community to talk to the public about what they are doing. And that's pretty much a similar picture. That is the Somali book that we created this past 
last year in conjunction with the community where they felt a need for materials that we were unable to find through publishers. And this year's book was a counting book. The year before was an alphabet book. So this is something that we worked with a publisher to and these families to create themselves and we made that book available to the public. Oh, you have Denise Juno in the picture, too. The yes. superintendent from public schools. And yes, yourself. We were, we were able to do that uh, at the New Holly Center uh, cool. just to honor them. And each one of them had a signing ceremony as, the, as authors and publishers. So it was a, a really fun event. And the community brought out really, really wonderful and lots of food for everyone there. One of the final things that I wanted to talk with you about is our work toward future readying the library system. And I know it's easy for many libraries to think about what does programming look like, what books are you going to buy, and um, what type of service will you offer. But one of the ways that we're treating this is we're really trying to understand what are the disruptors going to be that are going to impact the library. We recognize, as you'll see, that there are about nine uh, disruptors to the work that we do uh, that is going to impact our work. And just as an example, climate change is one of them. We have seven locations that do not have air conditioning. And as we serve more of the city in their regard to being warming shelters or cooling shelters, we're going to have to face that issue. And a second one is that urbanization and density is increasing. And these are, I should also say this, these are not just disruptors for the city of Seattle. These are disruptors across the world. And so we have identified these nine as the things that we need to think about for our future to ensure that we're continually relevant to the public as they wish to engage us. So at some point, we've been doing uh, presentations on this um, at library conferences. And so if you'd ever like for me to come back and present on that, uh, I'd be I was going to say those are our disruptors as well. But Yes, they are yours as well. So they affect every decision that you have to make. And certainly, uh, we're going to have to think about those as well. Marcel, I have a quick question sure. that I want to let us wrap up because we've got one more group, sure. two more groups. We kind of talked about this online, but if you don't have to answer, but if we can come back, are we going to be working on or looking at how we can um, provide library services or with the Seattle King County Jail? So we can talk about that um, some more and offline about it right now. Um, that is a service that King County Library System um, is technically serving. Um, I know that a few years ago there was a concern as to whether they would continue that, and King County has a new library director, and I just haven't had a chance to ask her, is she going to pick that back up? We'd like to make that a priority, too, in our work sure. plan. I really, as a former public defender and judge, having people having access to those materials, I know you can't bring a hotspot in there because they don't sure. have, but they have the other material, and that's always been a sticking point. Mm -hmm. So that was one issue that I'm hoping we can work on and put it in our work plan as well. Sure. So if we, we can will, be involved in those conversations, we'd, let, we'd like that. We will make sure to do that, and we will follow up with Regine right. on that. Anything else from my colleagues? Thank you, Allison. <laughs> and thank you thank so you much. Marcel. Sure, and we'll be sure. Are you leaving the additional books for the other council members? No, they don't get any. They're not <laughs> they don't get to <laughs> serve on the major committee. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yes, you can, Councilor This Ruskina. is my MO, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. <laughs> is there an effort underway between uh, the libraries and SDCI to look at how we use the airspace above our libraries? I'm thinking of uh, <laughs> D5 and mm -hmm. some of the child care housing conversations that we've been having, especially given the proximity to light rail. Is that a conversation that's already in the works? Not as a full, and I don't want to um, park anyone close to a bus, including ourselves. Um, it is not a conversation that is happening as a dedicated or directed conversation. We have been involved in some conversations with um, some community agencies who are interested in that type of thing, uh, the Georgetown project. We just bought a property in that area about a year ago, I think, and they've approached us about some sort of uh, collaborative work there. It does present some problems, and I think you might recognize that we also already have a, a joint or a condominium type approach with our Delridge Library. And so those are always conversations that we're open to having, but I will reach out to them and see if we can start a more formal conversation. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you sure. guys. OK, Thanks, thank Thanks, you so Allison. much. All right, thank you. Next. Item four, Seattle Center Overview and 2020 Work Plan. Mr. Nellums. It's 11.30. I know you'll be <laughs> snappy. Wait, how big is your PowerPoint? How long is your PowerPoint? 
not too long. Uh-huh. Not too bad. <laughs> we kind of know what's going on. You, you trained me well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't like that they changed my name to Public Assets Native Communities because then it's Pancake. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Nagin calls it. Everybody loves pancakes. Yeah, that's true. It is the favorite committee. <laughs> that's right. Mr. Nellums. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robert Nelms. I'm the director of Seattle Center, and I'm um, delighted to be here. And I just want to make one personal comment. I was not laughing at you. <laughs> I, I tell everyone that I work with that I absolutely love working with you because you read everything. <laughs> and I, so, thank you. The most prepared. So thank you. So I'm going to uh, go through uh, our presentation and. Um, uh, hopefully uh, get us or keep you on track beyond that so uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> okay well I, we always start with our our purpose we have uh, the purpose of Seattle Center is to create exceptional events experiences and environments that delight and inspire the human spirit uh, to build uh, strong communities um, and in we, we kind of do a, uh, um, uh, a thumbnail of that, a, a, a shortcut. It's just basically we like to delight the spirit and, and build community, and that's who and what we think uh, the value we add to this to Seattle is. Um, you know, uh, years ago, back in 2016, we did our last economic impact study, and I, I like to show these numbers not to brag or not to boast or anything like that, but just to remind people about the value that arts and culture has for our community. Um, uh, when we were talking about, you know, 12 million visitors or uh, uh, over 12,000 events or almost $2 billion of economic or business activity, um, uh, over $600 million in labor income, 75,000 uh, direct jobs, uh, over 18,000 indirect jobs. You know, it it's allows us to talk about the impact of arts and culture that we have in our community and the value of um, the values that this community has brought to the table uh, because uh, you would not create a Seattle Center in the part of any metropolitan area. This was something that our community decided they were going to do over 50 years ago, and it's still here. So um, I love to be... And thriving. Yes, they still here and thriving. <laughs> I, I love that we are the stewards of that, and I love the fact that we get to work with you to make that happen. Um, just to go over, you know, it's a 74-acre campus. It's, uh, a lot of people don't realize that we got over 40 acres of that are open and green space. Um, and I think that, that it's important to talk about, we, uh, we look at the, how we run this place, and we, we, we kind of have a, a, a 5P process. And these are the P's that we look at when we're looking at being the stewards of Seattle Center. We start with the place um, and the people. Uh, we look at the programs, the partnerships, and then we look at what is our performance. And so and when we're doing our strategic planning processes and so forth, th those are the P's that we focus on. I didn't bring our, um, our st strategic plan. I didn't uh, bring that to you because we're doing something right now as the arena is under construction. Mm -hmm. we, are, um, uh, we are in what we call a, a, a transition. So um, we're... we're in our strategic plan, uh, we had a plan that ended in uh, 2018, and then we started a new strategic plan in 2019. So 2019, 2020, uh, we're calling that the neutral zone for us because it's the time that we're, we had an, an ending. The ending was the closing of Key Arena. And in 2021, we'll have a new beginning, which will be the opening of a new arena. And in the 1920 uh, first part of 21, we'll be developing, okay, where are we going and what is Seattle Center going to be in, into the future? So um, we're, we're at a very uh, pivotal time, but we're also at a time where there's a lot of uh, opportunity for creativity, et cetera. I also didn't bring you an org chart for us because we're doing some reorging now to try to uh, pivot into this time and try to make sure that as we go into our future, we, we are uh, structured in a way that makes sense. And so I, I'll love to share that with you once we're done with that. Um, 
We also, you know, when I, I talk about the P's and so forth, the partnership, the place, the performance, um, the programs, the people, a lot, a lot of that has to do with, with the, the, the big, the small, the intermediate gatherings of community, and they're defined by the shared experiences that people have. And so, you know, we have some, you know, some of our highlight things, Festal, where we bring in our, all of the cultural communities and so forth, where we make sure that, that everyone in, our, in, um, in Seattle understands that Seattle Center is theirs, they own it. Seattle Center is a place where they can be um, um, part of, uh, they can share their culture, they, can, uh, they are welcome, and that they are part of a larger community, and that they bring all of us along to do that. But we also do, do those shared experiences through marches, runs, festivals, concerts, just a bunch of things that happen. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a you know, a catch-all. You know, you can't do 12,000 plus events a year if you're not doing multiple things each day. We're also a place where, you know, where the, some of the, the, the our, where our community comes together to mourn, to celebrate, and also to provide service to others. And so um, looking at, uh, and th this image has a couple of things. One, last year we did the first ever uh, remembrance of 9-11 with the police and fire. Um, and it was a beautiful uh, ceremony uh, that we did. And, and there's, if you look at the bottom of this picture, there's the uh, picture of the flower vigil that was held back, uh, back in to, uh, after 9-11 in 2001. So the, we do um, those types of things where folks come together as one. And um, we also do a lot of celebrations. And so, you know, there's the, we've had the storm celebration. We've had uh, the Sounders celebration. Um, we're also celebrating different cultures. So there's the spirit walk that, that's here in this picture. And then we also uh, want to focus in on the service that we can provide. And one of the things that we have at Seattle Center that is a little more unique than other places is that um, we have assets and facilities and staff that um, do a lot of different, a lot of different things. But uh, we challenged them years ago to say, how do we use these assets and this expertise differently? And what they came up with was the free health clinic that we're doing. And the sixth one will happen next week. And I would like to invite all of you to come tour that. Uh, if, you, if you're available, it will be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and um, uh, we, it won't be in the arena because it's under construction, but it will be in the X Hall, it will be uh, in McCall Hall, it will be in, in Cornish, um, it, um, and so on. And so it, it will be something to see, and, and we'll still be um, uh, serving uh, different as, uh, aspects of our, of our community. The other thing that, that's important to know about Seattle Center, I didn't, you know, is that we are a collection and a collective. There are over 30 resident organizations at Seattle Center, and they provide different segments, art, culture, they provide education, they do a number of things. You know, a lot of people don't know we have a high school, a public high school at, at, in the Army. A lot of people don't know that we have a school that teaches um, um, uh, uh, how to create video games and digital um, uh, 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 programs, et cetera. They don't realize that we have seven theaters. They don't, you know, there's just a lot that is, that is there. The thing to remember also is that uh, when I say Seattle Center is yours, there's only three pieces of property on this campus that is not owned by the city. And that is the, the Science Center, the footprint of the Space Needle and Memorial Stadium and the parking lot outside of that. Everything else is, is our property. Mm -hmm. And either we run it or we're the landlord. And so that relationship is something that we have. And that, that landlord relationship is something that has is, 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 uh, brought us things like uh, Chihuly and KEXP and, and uh, Mopop and et cetera. The other thing uh, to remember about uh, the 30 resident organizations, the facilities that are all the, the, the places and things that we own is that we've developed through these, uh, virtually every facility on the campus has been developed through a P3 or a public-private partnership. If you look at the McCall Hall with the opera and the ballet, the partnership with the rep, the partnership with the children's theater, their partnership um, with, 
um, uh, Mopop, et cetera. All of those are public-private partnerships, and all of those have elements that make sure that, that uh, the broader segment of our community can participate. So we, we pay because we are the, the, the city, and, and, and these are, are public uh, um, um, partnerships. A large, uh, for each of those entities, a large portion of what they would pay in rent to a uh, private sector, we collect as, as access for folks who couldn't uh, attend. So having access to MOPOP, having access to the uh, Children's Theater, having access to the Rep, having access to uh, McCall Hall, having access to those things are uh, through either tickets or programs that those entities uh, provide, and those are all part of our lease agreements that we have. In fact, we have uh, guidelines that set that up for us in the public um, uh, public sector. Um, the other thing that that I would say is is that we, I, I've spent a little bit of time talking a lot about uh, what we're doing, and and what does that that mean. I didn't bring you a, a thing on our budget either, because again, we're in the neutral zone, which means right now the arena is closed. We're not making the revenues that we were making before, so I don't want to. I'm an accountant by trade. I'm not going to show you red ink. We'll have a follow-up meeting. I yeah. just wanted to do an yeah. overview for but, the new members. But, but I wanted to tell you that there, the the fact that the successes are 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 plenty. That the. the the NEDO invested over $100 million in its renovation. The Seattle Opera built its uh, new building there. Um, um, the, the arena, of course, is coming. Uh, we're getting ready to do our fourth or fifth skate park um, uh, this year, um, and we're going to be doing some uh, improvements to the armory. But we will be enhancing Seattle Center um, as we uh, move forward uh, uh, with investments through our public-private partnerships. We also wanted to just highlight the fact that even though uh, most people would think, okay, you're talking about arenas and all the other stuff, we're still doing a lot of successful stuff. So very quickly, um, you know, our staff has just launched a new website. Uh, we've um, uh, uh, completed agreements so that ORCA could be on the monorail, or could be accepted on the monorail. Uh, we've updated our, our mural uh, stage and, and uh, sound systems, and we're going to uh, start with a new uh, program to have uh, uh, commercial concerts out on the mural uh, that uh, most likely will start this year. Uh, the clinic, of course, will return this, uh, next week, and, um, and as part of the agreement with the new arena, the clinic will continue once the new arena is open. Um, and then there's two just, just very brief things. Even though uh, our arena is closed and we don't have a lot of things going on, we're still uh, providing or, or getting revenue from uh, sponsorship deals. And we're, um, uh, the thing we're most proud of, even though the arena is under construction, we actually increased, increased the sales of our uh, facilities, our rentals of our facilities in 2019. Um, and so we're continuing to be successful. And of course, uh, I'd like to do a shout out to you all and the leadership of, uh, of the chair for the uh, agreement with the arena. Um, we're having a billion dollar investment to one of our public places. Um, uh, it's a place that's been here for 58 uh, years and, and now uh, with this investment, the, it will be here for 58 more. Um, and so there is, that investment is, is going to be um, a transformational. And I just wanted to really quickly t talk about how our, our relationship with OVG and that arena uh, uh, began. We began with three values. We were going to put people first. We were going to make sure that the placemaking of, about the arena and Seattle Center was, was um, going to be aligned and that uh, we were going to do this in a partnership. And so uh, we're, we're moving forward with that relationship and we're building a, a uh, a relationship that will last for years, if not decades. And then um, as we evolve, the uh, neighborhood around us evolves. And so that what that means is that as we start to transform, then, then the neighborhood around us does too, and there's investment there that is important to what's happening. So, you know, there's um, uh, the new Center Steps uh, facility on 3rd and Mercer um, is, is, to, is being built. Uh, the uh, Plymouth House is, uh, just broke ground on, on mm -hmm. a new uh, project to uh, create transitional or affordable housing on a, a piece of property that was Seattle Center's that we 
uh, uh, turned over to the Office of Housing, and then now they've turned this into uh, this project. Again, one city doing things together. The Uptown Arts and Cultural District has been formed, and they're starting to, you know, uh, spread their wings a little, a little bit. And um, the development of, of uh, and growth of the density of the spaces around Seattle Center um, is just uh, kind of. Um, uh, exploding and so we're going to have a lot of new neighbors very soon and, and a lot of new patrons to um, to accommodate now that was uh, oh, that was the end of that's all that's all I, I was going to bring to you uh, today because I was fourth and and I saw that you're not going to be having a lot of time for me I no, that's it. No. Well, what I wanted to do, though, is um, we're going to have a, a deeper, deeper mm -hmm. dive because of the work that we're doing with OVG and NHL, mm -hmm. the transportation piece, the NHL training percent. There's just a, we're just not there yet. So I just want to do an overview, but we're going to have a more intense briefing where it'll probably be just you mm -hmm. and um, our work plan and the budget and how we're moving forward. Because I know we have to vote on a lot of. Are we done voting on? Uh, um, right of ways and stuff. I think we're done with all yeah, that for yeah. the digging underneath mm -hmm. and closing off the yeah. streets and mm -hmm. the battery. Yeah. Did the Plymouth housing thing. So I think we're okay for now. Like you said, we'll just have you come yeah. back. So I, I'll just say that, that there's just a couple of things that are going to be coming down to fight for you. One is uh, most likely there's an uh, easement agreement at Westlake that we need to yes. uh, need to change so that uh, we can make some capital improvements there to increase the capacity for the monorail by the time the arena opens. So that's one piece of legislation that would come. And there may be a few others as, as we we're negotiating with some other uh, folks as uh, uh, mobile carriers about pr putting infrastructure on our campus, things like that. Yeah, we have some big stuff coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Anything else? Just to close well, without saying, <laughs> uh, we really appreciate the ongoing work um, from the center to work with the labor unions who are both reconstructing oh, yeah. um, all of the amenities down there and then the ongoing labor uh, that is provided in the buildings there. And I know that that's a strong partnership that mm -hmm. the chair has continued to lift up, um, but really excited about the recent uh, NHL conversations with our building trades folks. And I know there will be more to come, but appreciate that partnership and all the good work you're doing to lift up labor labor unions. Okay. Yeah, we well, got a great you. labor peace agreement. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mr. Nellums. Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's 1148 and I want to apologize to my friends, the Seattle Indian Health Board. You guys want to come on up and have Nagin read it to the record? M5, Seattle Indian Health Board overview and 2020 work plan. <laughs> yeah. Esther and Aaron can introduce themselves. Esther, before, I'll let you introduce yourselves for the record, but um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves for the record, for the viewing public. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, my name is Aaron Spark. Uh, my Chipik name is Amiguk. I'm an enrolled member of the Kishinami tribe uh, for the uh, native village of Chivak. I'm the chief public affairs officer for the Seattle Indian Health Board. And Chair Juarez, council members Mosqueda, Peterson, and Harold, thank you for inviting us. Um, hiate everybody, I'm Esther Lucero and I'm Dene and Latina and I have been uh, the CEO for the Seattle Indian Health Board just a little over four years. And what that means is you're stuck with me, Seattle. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for having us. And for folks I haven't had a chance to interact with on an individual basis, I'm really excited to build relation with you. Before we get started, because I want our new members to see, I, I've known what Seattle Indian Health Board has been doing for 40 years. Yeah. So I did give a big shout out to your organization and to Abigail Echohawk for um, being honored at NCAI. Mm -hmm. You guys will have a table there. And Senator Kamala Harris introducing her. So yeah. we're very excited about that. That. It's Yay. fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much. We've gotten, um, I think we're the first city in the country, and we've gotten tons of cities and governments saying, can we see the legislation? Mm -hmm. How are you integrating this person in the Seattle Police Department? Mm -hmm. How are you going to use the data? We're relying on your, your subject matter expertise and your culturally attuned organization Correct. to get us across the finish line and show other cities how to do it right, including the federal government. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting you... with Captain Diaz pretty soon to develop that job description. So. Oh, you are? Great. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So I'll let you guys go ahead into your... Okay. Oh, I see you got Auntie up there, Arlene. Oh, you do. Yeah, yeah. Laverne. Or Laverne. Laverne. Um, yeah, I, you know, the Seattle Indian Health Board has been in operation. We'll celebrate our 50th year this year. And so I think what I'd like to do is um, give you all some perspective on what we've been doing in the past four years. 
right? So I can tell you as a new CEO, when you enter into an organization that has a history and legacy, um, you know, in social justice movements and has been um, kind of a pinnacle, right, when it comes to urban Indian health in the nation, um, you have a few questions, right? Like, we can try to keep things copacetic. And I have to tell you, Councilmember Muscat, I'm super happy that you're here because of your knowledge of healthcare systems and understanding the impact of the Affordable Care Act and how that kind of played out in local environments, which was really one of the ways that we defined who we are today. So that's one thing. We could have just tried to float along with the way things have always been. Right? Because the leadership prior to my arrival had been in place for about 30 years. Um, we could go out of business. Quite frankly, that is a reality within healthcare organizations, community health specifically. We've seen lots of mergers um, for that reason. Um, or we could reinvent ourselves. And so what we did is we really took a look at our strengths and we recognize that we're best known for health and human services, but the truth is we are so much more than that as an organization. And so we built upon these pillars here. So you see health and human services, um, workforce development, research epidemiology and data, um, and policy and advocacy all centered on traditional Indian medicine. Because really what makes us unique and um, makes us important to our community is that we maintain our cultural integrity. Now that becomes challenging in this ever-changing healthcare environment, which I'll talk about a little bit. And just to add another note on Indigenous Knowledge Informed Systems of Care, we are going to go into a little bit more depth about it, but understanding that this took our entire community to help develop. It wasn't that when Esther came in, we were just going to sit down and do this, because in the past it seemed like maybe we may have been distant from the people that we were serving. So what we did was made sure we heard all the voices from our community, as well as our entire staff, right now numbering over 210 at the moment, to really find out what are our strengths and weaknesses, what do we have to build on, how do we communicate better throughout this entire system. So that's how we came to this place. Sure, we're going to start about, we're going to talk about urban Indians a little bit. Um, you know, so I'm third generation of my family to live off of our reservation. And um, so all of my history and knowledge and background is really grounded um, as an urban Indian, quite frankly. Um, you know, my mom will still go back to ceremony. She lives in Phoenix. And at the same time, our family has experienced many of the same things that our patient population does. Right. And so I just want you to know that as a leader of an urban Indian healthcare organization, there's that wasn't by coincidence. You know, this has been like my life's work. Um, so for folks who are new at the table, 71% of all American Indians, Alaska Natives live in urban in environments. That's significant. Now I want to keep this in perspective. So only 1% of the Indian Health Service's operating budget goes to urban Indian health programs. Right. That does, that's not to say that we want to um, acquire additional tribal resources, because quite frankly, that entire system has been grossly underfunded, right? Um, our tribal partners are in as much need as we are in. However, because we're an urban Indian health program and through the Affordable Care Act's um, implementation of new uh, state influence over healthcare systems, then local environments also become important. So for example, the Medicaid transformation dollars actually came into King County. I'm the co-chair of the King County Accountable Community of Health, now known as Healthier Here. That was very strategic because we know as an urban Indian health program that our risk is that we're forced into the broader mainstream system and our cultural integrity is constantly challenged, mm -hmm. right? We see that a lot with the, um, with the implementation of the changes from the RSNs to the BHO system where the county became uh, responsible for assessments, for placements into residential treatment, right? Immediately when that system was implemented at our residential treatment program, we, we went from um, serving about 80% of American Indians, Alaska Natives, down to 30%. And we had a hard time ramping that up. And quite frankly, without our Indian Health Service funding, there's no way we could have supported that treatment program on that BHO system. Mm -hmm. So we had to work with our tribal partners, you know, to make sure that we could maintain that continuity of care. And so when we did that, we immediately ramped back up to 80% of American Indian Alaska Natives in our residential treatment program. Now, I share that with you because you all have influence over those local systems. And understanding that we as an urban Indian health program are part of a continuum of care. And even though our services are beneficial to everybody, because we are a, a federally qualified health center, and we say that we serve all people in the native way, that doesn't mean that we want to take away the resources from our folks, mm -hmm. right? to serve others. 
we can do it together and build it collectively as a whole. And so I think council member uh, Mosqueda, that's where I really count on you, right? And, and the health committee and things like that to make sure that, that our unique identity is preserved. Yeah, so Urban Indians, I'll be really quick. Um, go ahead. I think for the um, folks who are listening to the plethora of the services that you offer, yes. it, it is um, still health-centered and that you're looking mm -hmm. at the social determinants of health and That's the way great. in which you've pulled all these services together really do help people maintain or improve their health. Absolutely. So I know that we, I always think health care, but it's so much more than that. And I just want to put a plug in for how this relates back to that health care services by looking at those social issues. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's be clear about that, right? We rose from community. Mm -hmm. And when our community said, now we're, you know, through the urban relocation program, we're now in cities. And that doesn't mean that our federal trust responsibility ends, right? We have rights to these benefits. We have rights to these services. And so when we think about social determinants of health, like homelessness, for example, that is a precursor to poor health conditions. Right? If you're living in a tent and you have to take diabetes medication, it's very difficult for you to, to maintain um, that consistency in your treatment. So we know that that's something that we have to really support and address. And we work with our partners in that. I think one of the things that's beautiful that's happening is that we have this generational shift in leadership happening right here in Seattle. And we're starting to see these organizations come together and build upon their strengths. So for example, one of our expansion sites is actually going to be at the Chief Seattle Club. Um, I think it's planned now for July 2021, mm -hmm. um, where we're opening up a 3,000 square foot clinic right in the building that um, Chief Seattle Club has just purchased, right, with 80 units of affordable housing up top. Um, that's important. Um, and the fact that we get to expand in that way, that means that we get to offer indigenous knowledge and form systems of care. So our culturally centered services right in that space. Yeah, and so you're right. I mean, so we look at social determinants of health. The other, the other focus for social determinants of health has been on gender-based violence. Obviously, that is us providing services to support the work that we've done from a policy and legislative perspective. And I just want to thank you again, um, Council Member Juarez, for really championing that work here. But we also know that once we call attention to that, we put resources into that, we address the data needs, the truth is we still have the trauma that we have to heal from. And the way we do that is providing resources to, su to support our organizations in providing those services. So you see an expansion in gender-based violence work. You see collaborations around addressing issues of homelessness, all that coupled with access to primary care, behavioral health. We've actually added an MSW practicum training program. We graduated um, our first round of students. Workforce development is obviously a core component. We're the only program with a chief traditional health officer, and we actually have a traditional Indian medicine apprentice program. Mm -hmm. We have jumped in the past um, four years from 158 encounters for traditional Indian medicine to now we average 1,300 encounters for traditional Indian medicine, just with little investment that came through the accountable communities of health. That is powerful. That mm -hmm. demonstrates need, that demonstrates value, and it helps us support one of the best preventative mechanisms when it comes to poor health outcomes, which is strengthening cultural identities. Mm -hmm. Significant, significant work. In the past four years, the Seattle Indian Health Board has grown our operating budget by 80%. 80%, right? And so we talk a lot about like building infrastructure and investing in that transformation. It's kind of like building a plane as we fly it. So if I look a little tired and have this additional gray hair, now you know why, right? <laughs> it's also the reason that we work as a team. You know, we've adopted the rapid decision-making model, so we make no decisions in isolation. We meet regularly with community to hear from community what they need. And that has really defined our indigenous knowledge and form systems of care and our expansion sites and our vision for the future, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So tribal partnerships are significant. So in addition to the planned expansion site at Chief Seattle Club, um, we just got confirmed by the Calix Cowlitz Tribal Council um, to open up a uh, shared space down at their Tequila site. So we'll be opening a pharmacy there and adding primary care services to supplement their medically assisted treatment program and also um, their behavioral health programming, right? Because again, what, that's what we do well. Additionally, we just received a grant to purchase a, a mobile medical, um, I'm sorry, mobile dental van. Um, we did that purposefully. We know that our tribal partners have a hard time getting dentists out into the tribal communities, especially rural communities. And I'll give you some perspective. We have a dentist that's uh, retiring this year. We have 30 applicants for that position right now. 
So at the Seattle Indian Health Board, we are competitive when it comes to um, getting the highest level service providers. Many people don't know that 50% um, of our uh, medical providers are native and many of them have Ivy League educations, right? Mm -hmm. So our ultimate goal is not only to serve our American Indian Alaska Native population who are from the lowest socioeconomic tiers and most marginalized and most in need, but also to serve all American Indians, Alaska Natives in the broader King County region. There are more than 40,000 of us here. Right? Mm -hmm. What's it going to take to get Councilmember Guarez to come see one of our docs? <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been there a lot. Okay, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just being quiet right now. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I would like to take the opportunity to invite folks there because we've had to do a lot of how can we make this work today while we're investing in a $42 million cap capital campaign to realize, realize our future, right? So, we've done some internal renovations to implement a um, team system where not only do you have primary care and behavioral health integrated, but you also have a traditional Indian medicine apprentice as part of your panel team. You also have clinical pharmacists as part of your panel team. And you have access to domestic violence advocates. You have access to um, homeless case managers, right? It is the most unique integrated model in the nation. And that is what we're implementing today. You also um, have your advocates for who have been victims of sexual assault. Yes. And nurses. Yep. And like I said, we've just expanded that program. We received a grant through the Department of Justice to actually enhance and build that program. Additionally, we'll be um, providing services to address perpetrators, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't throw our people away. Mm -hmm. You know, as tribal communities, we just don't do that. What we do is we address community as a whole and we heal together as a whole. Yeah. So, I mean, Aaron's trying to keep up with me, right? I look at these slides and I'm all, eh. We'll just get to that, you know, it's kind of background noise. But um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about our capital campaign. So uh, we are in the very beginning stages of a $42 million capital campaign. In that capital campaign, we'll revamp our clinic services to actually enhance services um, and to implement the indigenous knowledge informed systems of care that I just spoke about. And we will have four panel teams, um, all serving um, a, a panel of patients. Um, so that's really exciting. The third level will actually be a conference center because we know that with the exception of Daybreak Star, we don't actually have access to that right in the middle of Seattle. Um, so that will be available for use for, by all, all of our communities. Um, because of Abigail um, Echo Hawk's leadership, we have actually grown our Urban Indian Health Institute um, three times. Right? So our operating project has grown there, so we actually need to build um, an expanded facility for that, so that will also be on the third floor. Additionally, we'll have a space for ceremony. Mm -hmm. right? So we'll have a spot where we can actually host a ceremony for up to 30 people. Um, and our plan is to build out our network of traditional healers. Right now we have three, um, but we want to build it out with as many traditional healers from across the country. Okay. And then we'll have a traditional healer in residence who rotates through to be able to do ceremony and to do individual, um, you know, experiences. Um, so that will be on the third floor as well. Um, and then two floors on top of that, which is what you're going to be most interested in. So um, it, it's, uh, we plan to build 100 units of housing. 50 units each of housing. Um, again, we've been working with tribal partners on that. We've had preliminary conversations with Snoqualmie Tribe regarding that housing. Um, they're very interested in that um, so that we can actually meet some of those equity needs that are really challenging to do when you're acquiring federal dollars and you're, you know, um, affected by or, or you're responsive to fair housing and those types of things. We know that tribal partners actually have sovereign rights to actually uh, prioritizing American Indian and Alaska Native communities. We respect that. We are responsive to that. And so therefore, we know that that will be a significant um, partnership to implement as we move towards this housing. And yeah. I, I would like to add that when we're talking about the housing, currently our elders program has 40% of them being homeless. So immediately when we build these 100 units, we can house our <laughs> homeless elder program immediately. It's one of the things that we're looking at and to know that you've done something real for our community to know that the people we cherish the most who carried all of our, 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 our cultural knowledge along with them throughout their entire lives to get to where they are and understand that with our history of colonialism, it is a hard thing for an elder to get there. That's why they're so honored in our communities and this is something that we can do. I do want to go back and while we're talking about our expansion of the clinic with our four teamlets, this will have all of our services in each of those teamlets, including dental and traditional Indian medicine alongside pharmacy, uh, medical care, 
and behavioral health all in that one team. And that's that unique model that Esther was talking about where we'll be able to deliver that, not just here at the Leshi Center, there's gonna be four teamlets there, but we'll also replicate that when we open up our clinic at the Chief Seattle Club as well. And um, because I'm, development is now under me as a Chief Public Affairs Officer, I am gonna put in the plug right now that we are gonna be working with the city as far as new market tax credits and low-income housing tax credits go, because this is a very large um, that capital campaign that we're in the middle of, and this is something that's gonna benefit our entire community. So we're looking forward to working together. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to spend a little time on Thunderbird Treatment Center because of you know that lackluster article that came out in Seattle Times is really a little bit frustrating um, because I think it alluded to this idea that this was like some uh, reactive, you know, not well planned out decision. Um, completely inaccurate, um, especially for folks who know me. You know that I think of every single detail from start to finish. You know that I take the time that it takes to actually implement good systems and process. So I will tell you that the Thunderbird Treatment Center decision um, to relocate actually predated me. It's something that the board of directors has been discussing for a very long time, mostly because we are in a building that um, is very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, when it comes to maintenance and also the property site, in the location, it has been very difficult to serve the needs of our people. When I say that, it's, um, it, it's an old building and we had a hard time serving folks with physical disabilities right, because of the way it was positioned. Um, additionally, we needed to acquire an additional license to be able to provide mental health services and co-occurring disorders. That became also challenging because of, if you look at CARF accreditation and some of the requirements around facilities, site, all of that, um, it was difficult to do. Right, and that's, so, uh, we just outgrew that building. That's right. You started yeah, it like 30 years ago, the Thunderbird House, and it was cutting edge 30 years ago. That was 30 years ago. Yeah. And so we had to make a, a radical move given that we know what we want. So originally, Thunderbird Treatment Center was licensed for 92 beds. That's right. You know? So we, have, we now operate a 65-bed residential treatment program, and we want to get back to that 92-bed capacity. And I'm going to tell you why because we've been approached by our tribal partners consistently regarding pregnant women and needing to provide treatment for pregnant women specifically with medically assisted treatment. We know that our tribal partners, uh, we have a tribal partner out Fort Peck in Montana, and, the, and their next generations are being adopted out into non-Indian communities because their tribal policies say that if you're using while you're pregnant, then you lose your parental rights. And so, you know, they came to us and they said, hey, we really need to address this. You know, we have to preserve our next generation. So we hear that. We hear that very clearly. We also know that we have a need to serve um, parenting women, right? And just parenting people generally. And so in order to do that, we have to expand our site. We have to expand our facilities. We have to make it a secure environment. We have to add a playground. There are so many things that we have to do that we cannot do at our current site. So we're in, the pur uh, we're in the purchasing process right now, so I'm not going to share who's actually purchasing it, although many of you may know. I will tell you that it, um, it will be used for affordable housing, mm -hmm. right? I want you to know that we were very strategic about that as well because we were not just going to sell it, you know, to somebody um, who wanted to develop something that wasn't in line with our mission. Um, so again, we've been working on this for years. Mm -hmm. And we were very, uh, we had a very thorough plan with transitioning our, um, our relatives, our patients out. Um, and I will tell you that we just pushed pause on services and that came to a close on February 3rd. And everybody who was in long-term intensive, I believe there were three of them were transferred out. Um, most of them landed at Northwest Treatment Center, again, working with our tribal partners. Everybody else has a thorough aftercare plan. We will continue our traditional Indian medicine services and in the, in the immediate, um, what our alum have asked us to do is to expand our outpatient services to intensive outpatient. So we have a six-month plan to make that happen, um, and then we, we feel like we can continue those services until we locate a, a new property, and our plan is to build the premier center for American Indians, Alaska Natives, in the nation. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so um, I think we can skip over the policy platform. I think I've spoken to you quite a few times on this, just understanding that we're utilizing all three platforms that we have here, working with our tribal partners. When we talked about moving Thunderbird Treatment Center, Esther and I were very strategic in making sure that we talked to AT&I, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, so all of our tribal partners understood what our plan was going mm -hmm. forward. So when we said we did our homework on this thing and we put a lot of thought into this, we really did. But also being able to pull together our community and government partners to make sure everybody understands what that federal trust responsibility is, and also to show the special nature of what 
what we have going forward. We're not just a community health center. Whenever something happens when the federal trust responsibility is not, is not working or being fulfilled or being ignored, we can work with our tribal partners to make sure that we can address that either at the state level because of the Centennial Accord or even at the federal level because of co conferring consultation rights. And I want to thank you, Chairman Juarez, for championing how we're going to look at this as we're going forward in the future with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls uh, here in the city of Seattle when we talk about confer and, um, and consult policies here with the city of Seattle. And then now we're going to start talking about violence against women and girls. So we already know about all these things. We've talked to you about this before. Thank you again for passing this to the entire council and to the new members for supporting what we're doing here in the city of Seattle. These are very tough numbers to look at and to understand. Uh, but these are real numbers that we have. Um, also looking at all these, knowing that a lot of our women are not reported and they do not go into, um, and they will not report because a lot of times we're treated as a perpetrator rather than somebody who is a victim. So this is something that we're addressing not only with the legislation here, but at the state and federal level as well. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you that um, as, a, as a local body, as a city body, you have a real opportunity here because even though we've been able to present this data, right, and connect it to living in urban environments, um, federal legislation is really largely focused on tribal lands. And so that means our cities really have to step up so that we can actually provide the services that we need. Now, there are federal dollars that actually are pass-through dollars that come through the states and then into the counties and sometimes into the cities. And that is the area where I think that we can offer um, change here. Meaning, we've advocated very strongly for a carve out of those dollars to address American Indian, Alaska Native communities specifically. That's right. That to me is really aligned with the city's equity model. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys were getting funding from the county, though, under the Board of Health, correct? On the yeah, the Urban Indian Health Institute is right now. Yes, there's a partnership, no. but I don't think it's money yet. No, I'm talking for service delivery. We do get some gender-based violence dollars. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that they're not necessarily connected to those federal dollars that are aligned with federal trust responsibility. Oh. Instead, there's a carve out for tribes, which is amazing, right? We need to continue that. But for urban programs, we get left out of that. Right? So what can we do at a local or city level to make sure that we have access to those dollars to provide culturally responsive services, not just what everybody else is doing? That's Does that right. make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the policy basis for everything that we work with. And again, thank you for helping us pass 31900. But to understand that when we were working on that, we looked at two specific pieces that we can address right now. We're looking at the undercount and the miscount that we have with our data collection and reporting system. So that's something that we can help with right now, and that's what we're working to help you with as, as we're speaking, to make sure that anytime data is collected on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, that does include men as well. A lot of people keep on pointing that out, but that doesn't mean that they're excluded. MMIWG is the issue that we're working with right now. We're going to address this together. So we want to uh, end two spirits, and we want to make sure we're looking at the system overall to understand that when you collect that data, there's a correct way to do this, and there's a way that we can be responsible to our community, and that's what the Urban Indian Health Institute is doing along with the city of Seattle. Now, what my Department of Government Affairs is doing is also looking at that carve-out piece that we're looking at to say, if there are gender-based violence services that are out there, and we have such a big problem with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, where can those carve-outs happen to make sure that our uh, our specific Indian health service providers are working directly with our community because, again, our people have been marginalized in every aspect of society, and to go to somebody else who is not from the community is not something that happens very often. And again, when they do, they're oftentimes treated like a perpetrator and not a victim. So that's what we're, be, we're able to offer. So we're looking at that piece and then also looking at the different confer and consult uh, uh, methodologies that we can work with in the city of Seattle. You guys will be in D.C. next week, though, right? That's right. Yes. I see you everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we're in DC. yeah, we're in D.C. everywhere. Yeah, true. Um, I will tell you, though, through the gender-based violence um, dollars that we did receive through the county, we were able to establish a partnership with the Harborview um, Sexual Assault right. um, Nurse Examiner Nurse Team um, and really being able to provide them with uh, cultural training, right, a cultural attuned <coughs> training. And that's exciting. And also to work with an advocate who comes from our communities. You know, so my wife um, was a sexual assault nurse examiner this is obviously anecdotal data, but um, just from even her experiences within that one year, 30% of the folks that she saw were Native. Mm -hmm. We're going to have, this time next year, we will have data from our, our so that's, next, this time next year, we will have some really good numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that will help you in your funding, in your lobbying for that money on gender-based 
on the federal side and the state side. And, uh, and we're leading the country in this, and we, we said this earlier, 31900 really is out there. We're working with five other states, so you've gotten calls from your states, but there are people who have talked to us specifically to say, how did you pull this off? Because there are 12, <laughs> there are 12 different pieces of legislation, nine of which actually are doing something, you know, and then a lot of them are task forces, not necessarily associated with any real change that's gonna happen in the end. So people are asking us, what's the methodology working with you to make sure that we actually had a responsive system here? So what we did is we took that to the state level. We're working with, uh, um, Representative Deborah Lekinoff right now to make this happen. So we have a $250,000 proviso at the state level to bring all of our community together. This is law enforcement. This is the justice system. This is the legislature. This is Indian country. And even um, city count, I mean, uh, county managers, we're all going to get together and talk about how can we do this right? Because the state can really only talk about the highway patrol, but building that community together is what we want to do. And through those two years, we want to make sure what can we address legislatively and administratively together to make sure that we're addressing MMR MIWG the right way. Again, initially with the data collection and reporting platforms, as well as the service carve outs and confer and consult methodologies. Well, you can follow up with Nagin offline on how we can support you um, in Olympia on that particular bill with, with Representative Lakoff with Deborah. Absolutely, and I okay. thank you for that. There is a second bill that happened that just oh, popped up from, um, <laughs> yeah, you can see this is us right here when we passed the bill, and thank you so much again. You, uh, it's something that has been such a beacon for everybody else that we've been talking to, where people that we've never met before are calling us up and saying, thank you so much for actually carrying this thing through, and I know you're getting those calls too, but anybody yeah, we were just who's at associated with this, what's that? We were just at at and mm -hmm. I didn't see you guys down there in Portland last week. Yeah, we so, were there, yeah. Yeah, so we talked to, and Deb Holland was there, uh, Congresswoman, and we talked offline too because mm -hmm. we're going to meet with her next week right mm -hmm. so they're saying the same things you're saying so it is an epidemic um it's been going on for decades and now we're going to start looking not just at the trust responsibility to tribes but as you were saying the individual when they are in the city if we have such high numbers of missing murdered but rape and domestic violence victims that's right that we have been overlooked so mm -hmm. you know um council members i would just like to point out that this is an example of what we can do working together I mean, the truth is the work that we're doing, both from a service delivery perspective, from a policy perspective, from a research perspective, um, from a traditional Indian medicine perspective, is something that can be duplicated across the country. That's right. And so I'll just tell you, if you want to be the, at the forefront of change, positive change for Native folks, continue working with us. And that's really what we had. I think I jumped the gun a little bit talking about the state policy efforts. There was a second bill that popped up from Gina Mossbrook, who actually took one of the recommendations from our state highway patrol report to say that all of these cases need to be input into the NamUs system, which is a non-federal database. Uh, it is nationwide, but it's something that the community can access, and that builds community relationships. But again, tribes were not consulted with these, like just like the first two MMIWG bills, which is why the Representative Lekhanov bill is so important. But again work with us on these things. We can do this right, and we are the beacon for the rest of the country, and we are seeing a movement. I know people are finally starting to talk about this, but we're now at the point where we're moving the needle on this. People are doing something about it, and they're looking at us. All eyes are on us. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Amazing. Yes. Uh, I, I messaged my team. We would love to take you up on the offer for a tour, um, and maybe... Um, yeah, yeah. Chair, we could do that. The jointly. thing of going on a tour with Esther Lacerda is you have to do karaoke with her after. I will do that. I will do that. <laughs> Core competitor along with Aaron, so mm. they they it's don't play. Trained singer. <laughs> this sounds great. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so yeah, we'll Thank take you. you up on that. Looking forward we to it. We do work hard, play hard. That's yeah. true. <laughs> Is there anything else from our colleagues before we um, want to thank our guests for being here and the work that they've done? So first of all, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. We've been working on the housing piece. We were working with Callitz. We met with Snoqualmie. Mm -hmm. Big shout out to Liz Tail. Mm -hmm. Those folks, of course, Colleen Echohawk and the, all the Echohawks. All of them either have a medical degree or a law degree or a... Something. Something. All of them. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll see you guys in D.C. next, next week. week. Yeah. And um, I cannot tell you what great partners you are. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me go to the adjournment. The next meeting of the Public Assets and Native Communities Committee will be Tuesday, March 3rd at 2 p.m. And with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.